Now it's no secret that here in the dark swamp we share tons of scary stories every single month. From viewers just like yourself. And as always, if you have a story you'd like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit it as swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. Today's video will be a bit different. It's gonna be a nice long compilation of a bunch of scary stories I have read over the past couple of months. Now this is going to be an extra long video, this is going to be great for those who like to zone out while working, doing homework, or just falling asleep. As always, I really appreciate you guys for supporting the swamp the way you do. If you could, please be sure to slap that like button as it really helps this video reach more people. Be sure to subscribe if you're new, because it helps me grow. And let's get into these creepy and allegedly true horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. A Strange Note I Found by Tana C. I found this note while exploring an old abandoned building in my town. I wasn't sure what to do with it, so I typed it out and figured I'd send it into the dark swamp. Here it is. I want to start by saying I have always been skeptical of all things supernatural and otherworldly. That said, I'd be a fool to deny the presence of something evil at my job. I am Ryan, a 26-year-old man from the Lower Peninsula of Michigan. I've worked at my current job at a farmer's market for the last eight years. I've always loved working outside with the plants in the summer and the Christmas trees in the spring. It feels like where I belong. But lately, something weird has been happening. It started about two months ago right about when the sun started going down before closing time. I started hearing this... Well, if I'm honest with you, I don't even know what to call it. It was like a scratching, I guess. It's like the sound of metal against metal, but more like knives against metal, if you know what I mean. Like if Wolverine from X-Men took his claws out and ran them down the side of a shipping container. I never heard a sound more bone-chilling in my life. For a while... I thought it was maybe just in my head, just my brain trying to fill the silence of a slow day. One day, my coworker Leanna mentioned hearing the same scratching noise around closing time a few months ago. This had been going on for quite some time at this point, and finally, we couldn't take it. So, we took the problem to our boss, John. He and a few other workers had also heard the sound and he planned to check it out that night. So, after we closed, John stayed behind to check out the sound, thinking it'd be taken care of by morning. But when the sun dawned the next day, and I opened the store, John was nowhere to be found. I called his cell phone, but he didn't answer. And this was incredibly unlike him. Seeing as he owned a business, morning came and went, and eventually, the sun began to set again. Still, no one heard from John that day, and no one would ever hear from him again. On the night following that day, the beast in the vent seemed more antsy than usual, and I had a bad feeling about John's safety. Nevertheless, my coworker Dale decided to be a hero and go into the air ducts looking for John. As expected, Dale never returned. Now I know what you're thinking. Why hasn't this guy called the freaking police? Well... If I were to call the police and say a creature in the vents of my building is taking my co-workers one by one, doing God knows what to them, they'd probably think I'm crazy and probably blame me for the disappearances. So, that wasn't even an option. About a week later, I finally had my first morning off. It had been too long since I got to sleep in, and as I was looking forward to a stress-free slow morning, I woke up around 10.30 and made some eggs for me and my dog Waylon a 10-year-old border collie who still acts like a puppy. I took Waylon for a walk through the neighborhood and he played in the leaves like he often does this time of year. Overall, it was an excellent start to the day. I got to work around 3 and when I arrived, Amelia's car was parked in her spot, but she was missing. I frantically searched the whole store, hoping she would be reorganizing in a place she usually wasn't. However, my hopes were crushed after the whole building was scoured twice and Amelia was nowhere to be found. My heart sank to my stomach as I realized what had happened. 
Amelia had most likely heard the beast scratching this morning and went to check on it for herself. Lena got to work around 3.30 and asked me where Amelia was, making some jokes about how she was always leaving early. But I swear I saw her stupid sticker cover car when I got here, Lena questioned. Yeah, about that. I think she heard the scratching and went to check it out alone, I replied. Oh, shoot. Well, now I feel bad about the comment on her car, Lena said, trying to put a lighthearted spin on the situation. Lena has always been a little slow but fearless, but when she suggested that our friends were playing a prank on us to get out of work, I wasn't really surprised. I'm just gonna go up there and bust them, she said eagerly. I begged her not to go, knowing that her fate awaited her in the vents, but she persisted. She crawled up into the ducks, and that's the last time I saw her. As I'm writing this, it's my turn to go into the vent to rescue my friends. I know what the vent holds for me, but I couldn't go, I couldn't honestly live any further with the guilt of not trying to save my coworkers. So I'm writing this as a warning to whoever finds this note, stay away from this building, for it isn't owned by Jonathan Settersville anymore. The beast holds it. That's the end of the letter that I found. I'm not exactly sure what to do with this information. Should I call the police? I don't even know. Hopefully, 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 it's not real. Small Town Haunting by Lynn Dear Swamp Dweller, I've been listening to your stories for a while. I finally got the courage to share my own. Mind you, the story at the beginning will be a bit hazy, as it happened to me when I was five. But as my story goes on, because it continued until I was 22, it will become much clearer. When I was growing up, I lived in a small town in Ohio. To protect my family and friends, their names will be changed. Now, I have an older sister who I will call Lucy. We live in a small trailer outside of a small town literally in the middle of nowhere. It would take us 20 minutes to get to any major stores. One night, my sister Lucy was inviting her friend who I will call Jessie over to spend the night and have a sleepover. At the time, me and my sister had shared a room. Jessie was one of my sister's odd friends. She was gothic and into creepy stuff. Not to say there's anything wrong with that, but I was just kind of off put by it at the time. So, she had brought over a Ouija board. Me being five years old, not understanding the significance of it, I thought it was just some kind of board game. Well, later that night, I want to say sometime around midnight, my sister Lucy and her friend Jessie pulled out the Ouija board and told me to go to bed. After putting a ring of salt around my bed and around them saying it would protect us. Well, being a little kid, I wanted to see what the big kids were doing. They turned off all the lights and lit a couple of candles. Both sat cross-legged on the floor with their hands on the indicator. Now, I'm not really sure what it's called. Then, they started asking questions. Within a few minutes, they started receiving answers. Both did the normal reaction, which was, Did you move it? And they kept blaming each other. After a few minutes, they realized that neither one of them were doing it, and there was an outside force moving it. At one point, whatever was doing it asked them to both lay on the floor. I remember this very clearly. Maybe about 5 to 10 seconds after they laid on the floor, I saw a red orb and white orb enter the room. I was so confused, I had no idea what was going on. Then, as I watched from my bed, I saw the red orb enter my sister, and the white orb enter Jesse. For a few moments, nothing happened. Neither one of them moved. Then it was like all hell broke loose. Dark shadow figures swarmed over me in my bed. I started to scream. My mother heard all the commotion, and when she came in, I was being lifted off the bed by my hair. My sister and her friend were stuck to the floor and could not move. My mother started chanting something. I couldn't for the life of me tell you what it was that she said. But whatever it was, it worked. I felt my bed and my sister and her friend both sat at the same time. My mother looked at them and then looked at me. She saw the Ouija board on the floor and asked my sister and her friend what they had done. When neither one of them would answer, she asked me. I told her what I saw and what had happened. 
my mother was angry at my sister and her friend. She took the Ouija board away and went outside to burn it. As I would later learn, that is not the thing to do. For ten years after that, nothing happened. My parents had bought a double-wide trailer and put in a basement foundation to make it look like a real home. When building all of this, we had a lot of problems. The biggest problem that I could remember when we were doing the basement foundation and the back wall of the foundation, it fell in. We chalked it up to nothing but natural occurrences, but it kept happening, and it was a pain in the butt to get it to stay up. I don't even remember what they ended up doing to make sure it didn't happen again. The year I turned 15, my mother had gone to an antique store and bought an antique mirror. She hung it above a 55-gallon aquarium. One day, me, my sister, and my mother were sitting in the dining room. We were all talking about mundane things about our lives. All of a sudden, we heard something running through the house and then a child's laughter, and then my bedroom door slam. Me and my mother and my sister both looked at each other in shock and horror. We had no idea what had just happened. Things continued to get worse from there. There was one morning during the summer I had woken up late from staying up all night. My mother had been working a 70 hour work week and had the day off, so she was sleeping in too. When I walked out into the kitchen, I screamed because all the cabinet doors were open and all the dishes were stacked on the counters. It was insane because there were like canned vegetables on top of them, balanced in ways that were just not natural. This was stacked in a way that would be extremely odd for any human being to do. When my mother heard the scream, she came out of her bedroom and saw what had happened. She had started to put the pieces together, so she did her best to seek help. She talked to my father about it. My father was a skeptic and he had never really, you know, witnessed any of these events, so I don't really think he believed in any such thing. This ends up in an argument between the two of them. Eventually, my mother just waited until he was away for work to go to a Wicca priestess to ask for help. The priestess gave her things to bless the house with. She sent me away to one of my friends and called my sister over who had moved out a while back for some help. I do not know the events that occurred that night. I do not know what really went down, but for at least a year, things were okay after that. Until one night, I was in the living room. The way our living room was set up was that we had one large couch, which was set up against the window next to an end table. On the other end was another end table and a love seat. So it was shaped like an L with the coffee table in the middle. Next to the other end table at the end of the large couch was the TV stand. We also had a fireplace in the living room which was across from the large couch directly opposite. It was a weekend and I was working on a project for school. My parents were out grocery shopping. So I sat at the coffee table on the floor working on my project while watching TV with my back to the fireplace. Suddenly, I got the strange feeling like something was watching me. I started looking around, and then I looked at the fireplace. I noticed movement in the fireplace. As I kept on looking at the fireplace intently, I noticed a face. Whatever this thing was, had scraggly hair with cat-like eyes that were green in the most demonic smile I could ever imagine. It had what looked like alligator teeth. I was so entranced by it, I kept on staring at it, and then I decided to draw it. It moved its head back and forth, and finally, it said something to me. It said, I have been with you for many years, and I will never leave. Even when you think I'm gone, I'll still be there. At this point, being scared out of my mind, I ran to grab my house phone and called my mother and told her she needed to get home now. When her and my father got home, they asked me what I was doing in their bedroom. They could see me from the window while they were driving up the driveway. I told them I hadn't even left the living room. I was too scared to move. My parents did not believe me because my mother got upset and told me I shouldn't be telling stories. Two weeks after this event was when things really got bad. My father was away on work again. Me and my mother were sitting in the living room watching TV together. As we were watching TV, we started hearing bangs on our front door. My mother went to check on what it was, and there was no one there. She sat back down and started watching TV with me again. Then we heard footsteps running across the house from my bedroom to their bedroom and the door slamming. 
the laughter of a child followed it again. Me and my mother both looked shocked to each other. The cabinet doors in the kitchen all started opening and closing and banging hard like somebody was angry. The mirror above the fish tank started vibrating and banging off the wall. At this moment, me and my mother both stood up and ran for her bedroom. She went to her side table and pulled out sage candles and the Bible. She lit the candles and the sage and started repeating a verse from the Bible. I started to become angry and felt sick all of a sudden. After about 20 minutes of her just repeating the verses, everything stopped. She asked me if I was okay, to which I replied I did not feel very well. She put her hand on my forehead and realized I was burning up. A few hours later, after we cleaned up everything, I felt fine. The fever was gone. Many years later, I had entered a bad relationship. When I was around 22, me and my ex decided to go on a night drive. It had been raining for quite a few days and we wanted to get out of the house. We were coming down a steep hill and all of a sudden, something was before us. When I say something, I knew exactly what it was. It was the same scraggly figure I had seen in my fireplace all those years ago. But this time it had a body and it was about six foot tall and it had long claws for hands. My ex slammed on the brakes to try to avoid it and we swerved past it. It reached out towards the car, trying to scratch out at us. Our tires blew out, and he started swerving uncontrollably down a hill with a curved bottom with an embankment. We went over the embankment, and we landed on a bush allowing us to land softly, luckily. My ex had hit his head on the window on the driver's side. I had been wearing my seatbelt and was not injured too bad. He was unconscious for roughly five minutes. Well, I was trying to get out of the car to get help, we landed on the opposite side, so the only way out of the car was through my door on the passenger side. When he finally came to, he helps me open the passenger door and climb out. Mind you, in this moment we were both in shock. He decided he was going to walk back to his house and pull the car out with his truck. He told me to stay there and wait. As I did, the figure appeared again, this time within 10 feet of me. It spoke without moving its mouth with that same demonic smile. I believe it was trying to say something to me, but I couldn't decipher it this time. My ex started coming down the hill with his truck. When the light hit the figure, it disappeared. I didn't tell him what happened. I was too scared and I thought I was still in shock. A few months later, me and him broke up. I have not seen him since, although I have heard about him. And things in his life have gone bad. I don't know if it was the creature's doing or if it was just karma. I do know when I speak about these events that they send chills down my spine. I have not seen the figure since that day. I pray that I never will again. I don't know if it came from the Ouija board or not, but I refuse to have one in my home or around me. Sorry this was long-winded, but this really did happen. I hope you decide to share this on your show. I love listening to your stories and hope you continue with it. My Friend, Miv, by Anonymous. I've always wanted to share this story. I've heard many paranormal stories and there's always a little voice of doubt in terms of the storyteller's authenticity. But while these events didn't happen to me, they did happen to someone I was very close with and contain a few elements of corroboration. It's important for me to get a feeling for honesty when listening to a story that defies scientific belief. So, for what it's worth, this is an honest account. First, a little backstory. Miv was a fascinating woman. She was one of my best friends, which is a little odd because I met her when I was about 18 years old, and she was in her middle ages. I was a young guy into motorcycles and rock music. I played guitar and was into horror movies and working out. As a contrast... She was short, dumpy, had thin greasy hair, a walking stick, and wore thick bottle rim glasses. She was never without a cigarette in her hand, and her ashtray was always full. However, she was an unbelievable astute and wise woman, to the point where she was like a wise old oracle to me and my hippie friends. There was never a personal problem she could not fix with a few gentle words. I would often go to her tall, slightly creepy Victorian terrace house and we would sit in her favorite room and chat philosophically. The air full of smoke and surrounded by dusty antiques and the odd stuffed bird 
Her husband was, by all accounts, a wretched man. His nickname, by all, was the Wizard. Their house was pretty much all wood floors, narrow but tall. He wore an orthopedic shoe, known colloquially as a club foot. You'd hear him coming and clomping down the wood stairs from a mile away. As his nickname suggested, he had long gray hair and a little goatee that resembled a stereotypical devil. He always wore a gray suit and had wild staring eyes. He didn't seem altogether and right in his mind. That was apparent during any conversation you would have with him. I don't mean he was like crazy, more like he was old, significantly older than Miv, and his mind was just a little aged. When he was younger, he also gained a reputation for black magic. One brief account I heard was that there was a black magic circle known for their dark deeds, something like the Golden Dawn or something like that. Well, they wouldn't let him join because he was too dark. Suffice to say, he was probably into summoning things. Anyway, over the years before Miv died, we became very close, and I heard all kind of cool stories. The story I'm about to recount is, I guess, not so cool. At least not for her. But it's an interesting one. Years ago, when she and her husband were living in South Wales in the UK, they lived in a similar house to the one that I knew that she lived in. A tall, slightly spooky, aren't they all, Victorian terrace house. These houses were usually three stories, maybe a basement. I've lived in one myself, and they're inherently spooky, which kind of sets the tone. At the time, Miv and the wizard had just had their first child, who would grow up to become one of my best friends about 24 years later. She had also, she had also, not too terribly long ago, come out of a brief stint in a nun's convent, so she was very religious. With that came certain beliefs and attitudes which would soon be very much tested to breaking points. I'm not able to be exact with the timeline here, but Miv told me that she started hearing voices, distant at first, in the house, when no one was around. As if often the case in many of these stories, she shrugged it off and ignored it as best she could, but then the voices started to address her directly. Now at this stage, she recalls being very worried that she was in fact unwell, and her biggest fear was that her son would get taken away from her due to her inability to take care of him. So, she told no one. The voices got worse and eventually would start saying things like, We're going to drive you mad. And she would say things like that, and so forth. If that wasn't enough though, she would soon start to see a dark shadowy figure at the top of the stairs. She told me that it would always appear in such a way that as you turned to look to see if there was something there, you'd almost stumble at the top of these steps and fall to your death. Still, she refused to talk about it. In her mind, and with her religious beliefs, there was no room for ghosts to exist, so it was a subjective phenomenon, and she was indeed losing her marbles. In this house, they had a cleaner. The cleaner would always leave the front door wide open when she was cleaning the stairs in the hall. Miv assumed it was to get fresh air, maybe to help dry the floor. One day, when it was cold, Miv questioned her. Why do you keep that door open? It's so cold. Her response changed Miv's life at this point. She said, It's so if that dark thing at the top of the stairs comes for me, I can get out of here right quickly. Again, bear in mind that Miv had not told anyone about this phenomenon. One day, she had a friend over. The friend was a big, burly, tough woman who stood no nonsense. She didn't believe in any of this supernatural rubbish and was not afraid of ghosts. After sitting in their living room and this lady giving Miv something of telling her off for being so silly and superstitious, the lady got up to go to the bathroom. She came back a moment later, her face white. You okay? said Miv. Can you come with me? replied the lady. Because you don't know where the bathroom is? No, because I'm not going up there on my own with that dark shadow. Another story shared with me was that Miv was bathing her son in the upstairs bathroom when someone knocked on the front door to the house. She yelled down to them, and it turned out to be a friend, so she shouted for him to come up and that she was in the bathroom. She heard him walk up the stairs. He then suddenly broke into a sprint, came running into the bathroom, threw his arms around Miv, and clung to her like a baby terrified of what he had just seen. Eventually, 
It all came to a head when this entity started to entice her into something more sinister. She recalls hearing the voices beckoning her upstairs to the dark top floor bedroom. The weird thing here, and what's hard to explain, if only because I don't quite understand it, is that she felt compelled to obey. It got her up the stairs. She would stop. She would resist, and it would gently insist that she continues upward. And again, she would obey against her will. This happened all the way until she got to the bedroom with the lights out. If I recall correctly, the thing asked her to turn the lights out, and she at first said no. But again, it insisted. This is crazy, I know. It eventually got her to lie down on the bed. Laying there in the dark, she then described how this entity began to assert itself onto and into her body. She described it like assault, but through her pores, if that makes any sense. She began an internal struggle at this stage, and in that struggle was able to draw some willpower to call out the name of Jesus or something like that. I forgot whether she said a small prayer, but some form of religious statement, and the thing went away instantly. I'm sure there are many other anecdotes. The other friends in our circle know of these stories too and have probably heard their own tales, so I may be missing a few key pieces. All I know is that they shortly moved out of that house. Now, one thing that does stand out as interesting, after discussing the story with a mutual friend who knew Miv for years before I met her, he told me that she'd also said this to him, but around that time that they left the house for good, she saw the wizard kneeling and burying something, and it was thought that he was doing something. Whatever he was doing, though, resembled a closing ceremony for when someone summons a demon. I know some of this won't make any sense, and I don't really expect it to. Why would you stay married to someone that evil, though? I asked myself that question. In fact, you know something? I asked her that same question at least once. She took a long drag on her cigarette, gave a long, slow shrug as she exhaled, and said something about feeling sorry for him. The whole dynamic will have me scratching my head. Miv was incredibly wise in some ways, and yet nonsensical in other ways. But there seemed to be more to that family story than meets the eye. Eventually, they would have a daughter, who was born physically and mentally disabled. The daughter is only surviving family of the member now. My friend, her son, died of cancer about seven years after I met both him and his mother. The wizard died around that same time, too, and Miv, heartbroken over the death of her son, died just two years after we buried him. She used to say, When I die, I'm going to haunt you, in her usual playful way. Eyes twinkling, taking a drag of a cigarette. She meant to come back and give me a clue about the other side. After attending her son's funeral, I was walking on the waterfront of my hometown. I was thinking about them both, and I felt tearful. I sat on the seawall and spoke to her. I asked her why she didn't come to me to show me any evidence of the other side. I concluded, well, maybe she tried, but I can't see it. Maybe I can only see what I can only see. I stood up to walk away, and something compelled me. I don't know what or why to look down where I was sitting. There, etched into the very slab of concrete I was sitting on, was the first, initial, and the last name of her son, who we had buried two days before. Creepy Vehicle Encounter by Anonymous So this story just happened to me. It's not super glamorous or anything concerning, and it's definitely creepy. I think it's worthy of going on the show. A bit of clarity. This happened on the road. I drive a little red mini hatchback, and I am a male. I was coming home from a friend's house, and it's a lovely moonlit night where I live, and I'm a massive fan of taking photos of creepy back roads at night, like headlights lighting up the cross section or a stop sign. It's just a weird little hobby but I always make sure no street names or dresses appear in them. But I digress. After a late night of playing Magic the Gathering, I was driving home from a friend's house and decided to take an old dirt road home instead of the main highway. The old dirt road cuts through most of the country and goes through the county, but no one usually takes it because it's hardly maintained. The old dirt road is something out of a horror movie, so I grabbed some shots of it on my way through 
and, you know, as I was doing this, a large truck pulled off on another side of the road. I didn't think anything of it at first and thought it might have been an officer out on patrol. It was about 1am at this point and police will regularly patrol some of these more unused backcountry roads from time to time, at least from my experience. I couldn't make out the vehicle well other than it was a truck. Black paint, I do believe and one of those four light setups on the front when you have had cattle or a ram bar system installed. Eventually, I got to the old dirt road and turned down it, and noticed in my rear view that the car had also turned down the road as well, and then had pulled off to the side. I didn't think anything of it, figuring that they lived down this road or figuring they were trying to get some sort of signal on their smartphone. Then they started driving in the same direction as me once more. When they closed the distance of about 13 yards or so, they slowed down again. Call, call me a bit paranoid, call me a bit, you know, anxiety ridden, whatever, but you get an eerie feeling when a car follows you down a nearly abandoned road at 1am. I neared an intersection and decided to turn instead of following the dirt road and head back towards the highway. I was starting to get that gut feeling that something just wasn't right here. I don't know how to explain it but it's like a knot in the abdomen mixed with anxiety or nervousness. I drew my knife. I kept it with me for emergencies, and it sat in my car seat next to me. I am genuinely unsure of what I would have done with that or how much good it really would have done in a situation at all, but it did make me feel better. Once I turned off the dirt road, I gunned it for about two miles at about 70 miles per hour going to the stop sign where I could have turned back onto the highway. I looked in my rear view mirror and there the truck was. They blasted it to catch up with me and gunned it before slamming on my brakes and stopping only about a foot away from my bumper. I freaked out, grabbed my knife and just sat there for a second. It felt like several minutes but wasn't before turning onto the freeway. The truck was sat there before pulling onto the highway a while, crossing and turning around, sitting there before heading back down where it had come from. I got home just fine, a bit shaken up but ultimately okay. Compared to some people's tales I've heard on this show, it's not that scary. The whole thing had me instantly thinking of the other stories I've heard on your show, though, Swamp Dweller. And if you decide to share this, thank you so much. I I had this very crazy feeling of almost excitement when I felt the danger. But after I was done with this whole situation, I felt so drained and very tired. Unexplained Events in Joshua Tree by Hill Billy Swag I was camping at Joshua Tree in the Black Rock Campground on the night of July 23rd of 2018. I'm not from the United States and I had flown in to do a Western United States road trip in a motorhome. Some of it alone and some of it with a friend. In Joshua Tree though, I was all by myself. Anyway, I got to the Joshua Tree campground in the late afternoon. There was a very intense heat wave at the time, so it was almost empty. There was probably only one or two other groups in the campground, and I didn't notice any rangers because it was off-season. Now this campground is close to civilization, perhaps maybe only a 10 minute drive, but it felt like the middle of nowhere to me, especially being so empty. Naively, I chose the most isolated lot at the back of the grounds because it was closest to all the beautiful desert plants and cute jackrabbits. But it backed right on to where the wilderness began. Before sunset, it felt so lovely and peaceful, and I wandered around taking pictures on a hill by my van. After dark, being a lone young woman and my first time camping alone in such an area, I found sleeping quite hard. I held my pocket knife and pepper spray in my hand and eventually drifted in and out of sleep. But I kept having these very realistic nightmares of someone knocking on my window and attacking my van. Eventually I gave up on sleep and stared out my camper van window, messaging my family back home and looking at the sky. Well, all of a sudden, about six bright gold lights appeared in the sky. They looked like fireworks right before they would explode but instead just hung suspended in a half-moon formation, incredibly high in the sky. Then these lights went out and another appeared in the far distance to the right, that hung in the sky for a few seconds before two disappearing. Now, I'm not a firm believer in otherworldly occurrences, but I don't not believe in them either. 
I googled to see if there was any astrological event that might have explained it, but I couldn't find anything. Also, these lights weren't moving in any sort of direction like a meteor or a shooting star. They were just hanging there suspended. I would love to know if anybody has ever had any sort of similar experience or if anybody has an explanation for them. Something is weird about Tyler State Park by Anonymous. This is a story that happened to me not too long ago. This story will need a backstory for it to make sense. So I live in rural Pennsylvania and my name is Tom. I live near a park named Tyler State Park. It's a very gorgeous spot for riding horses and going on walks. I bring my dog here and often ride horses down the trails. It's a pleasant place and I've never really had a weird experience. Everyone should experience the feeling of riding a horse. It's majestic. Anyway, I know a man named John. He's around 70 something years old. I forget the exact age. He owns a horse farm, White Pines Horse Farm to be exact. He fought in the Korean War and has a bad hip, so I help him occasionally with things such as dropping hay in his fields, filling water troughs, and stuff like that. For that, he lets me ride a horse named Irish Red for free. It's a beautiful chestnut horse, pretty, energetic, but friendly overall. We have that exchange and it's been a thing for quite a few years now. Remember, I said that I lived near Tyler State Park. Well, John's farm is right on the edge of the park, so I have easy access from a route not traveled on quite often, which is where the story begins. It was February 26th, in very nice out, for the first time in quite some time. Winter had hit us hard this year, and we didn't get very many days like this. Like my mother said, Mother Nature is bipolar. When I woke up, I decided to walk to the park before taking Irish on a ride with my dog Lola on a walk. I left and drove to the farm, called John to let him know I was going to be taking a walk today, and he replied, It's beautiful out, have a great walk. I remember that vividly, and I don't know why. I parked my car outside the barn, went to the trail. It was probably only about six or seven meters away from the barn and started walking. I was by myself and the whole trail was empty, which was almost creepy now that I think about it. The woods really did seem to throw ominous sounds at me, like, like there was something just right beyond where I could see. I enjoyed the walk overall until what happened next. As I was walking down that part of the trail that was next to the river, I noticed a man on the other side of the river. He wore baggy gray sweatpants with a black baggy sweatshirt on. He looked about 40 or older, which was strange because I've only seen younger people around here. Not to say that that's too weird, but you know, just an observation. But what caught my attention the most was that he was holding a gun. Now I'm not sure about hunting laws, but I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to hunt with a Glock. And I'm also pretty sure you're not supposed to have a firearm in a public park. I was creeped out now, and then he noticed me. He looked up, surprised, and threw his gun in the dense woods behind him. I laughed to myself a bit and wondered what drugs this man could potentially be on. I called over to him, something along the lines of, What are you doing? He replied with nothing, and stared at me as if I had the gun. I called out that I saw the gun, and when I said that he turned so fast, grabbed the gun, and then... I realized though the gun he had picked up was not the pistol he had thrown. This was a marksman rifle but I haven't searched every detail of the police report quite yet, so I don't know the exact model, so forgive me. He screamed at me to not call the police. It isn't what it looks like, all that typical BS, but I didn't care and asked why he had a gun and why he was pointing it at me. He said he didn't have to answer anything, so I said, and I regret saying, I'll call the police if you don't tell me. This made him furious. Then he said that I would never get the chance and raise the gun. I've never been so scared in my life. I turned and ran, and then I heard three loud gunshots. I pulled my phone out and called John. As I click on my phone app and press his contact, I see him waiting across the river, already halfway. John picked up and I told him the story in about less than 20 seconds. I'm surprised he kept up with how fast I was talking. He told me he would call the police and to keep running. I ran and I also dialed 911. 
Again, I heard four more gunshots and about four noises whizzing by my left and right ears. I approached the corner and decided that my stamina would soon drain to empty and I would have no fight left. So I turned the corner and hid behind a tree. I looked around for a big branch, a log, or a stick, absolutely anything, but I saw nothing. I heard his footsteps get louder around the bend. I braced myself for a life or death situation. He passed by the tree. I pounced on him. He screamed and dropped the gun. I grabbed it and backed up, pointing it right at him. He raised his arms and I said, I mean no harm. Or something like that. Maybe I said I don't want to hurt you. I was so amped up I don't remember the exact words. I said that he had to get down and wait until the police got there. He got mad at that and charged me. The next thing I knew I hit him right in the head with the gun. He was out cold. I kicked him hard in the ankle to make sure he couldn't recover quickly. But he got up a lot quicker than I thought he would. He would have had some sort of disadvantage I thought. But he got up pretty quickly. And I don't mean to sound like some sort of cliche hero type or something, but I was able to subdue him until the cops got there. He was sent to the mental hospital and some sort of rehabilitation for quite some time. I hope when people hear the story, they take caution and be careful. Carry pepper spray. Carry any sort of self-protection. Whether it's a gun, knife, anything is better than nothing. You may not like it, but this is how it is out there in the world now. Followed in the Kahuta Wilderness by Renegade23. When I was 18 years old, I spent a lot of time in the Kahuta Wilderness. My favorite spot was a set of waterfalls several miles from the nearest parking lot. Most visitors just parked in the RV area and swam in the creek right along the gravel road. In the two years I hiked those trails, I never saw anyone further than a half mile into the course. Anyway, one Saturday, I took my girlfriend to the waterfall since she had never seen one in person. We set off on the trail, and not 15 minutes into the walk, she grabbed my arm and got incredibly quiet. She said she felt like she was being watched and had the heebie-jeebies. I assured her everything was safe. The only thing I'd ever had to worry about in my part of the woods was the occasional bear or a copperhead. We continued, but she couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. I just figured she wasn't used to the wilderness and was having trouble adjusting. After a couple of hours, we finally reached the trail's end and had a picnic at the bottom of the falls. After we finished eating, she tried to check her cell phone for messages and panicked when she realized she had absolutely no service. I explained to her that there was no cell reception around for miles, and we were probably finally as alone as we could be and let's just enjoy the peace and solitude, which of course made her panic. We started returning almost immediately because she was scared, and I couldn't help but smile, thinking it was kind of a bit silly. On the way back, I explained to her how many times I'd been out here all alone and never had any problems, but she still just could not shake the feeling of being watched. We were about a mile from the falls on the only trail around when we heard someone call from behind. I nearly jumped out of my skin and turned to see a man walking toward us. He had a rifle over his shoulder and a heavy beard with his hat tipped low. She took a small step behind me. Uh, what can I do for you? I asked, trying to sound friendly. You guys left your cell phone back by the falls, he said. I saw a slight grin behind his beard as he looked at my girlfriend. Oh, thanks for the assist, I said extending my hand. He shook his head and told me he didn't bring it and that it was still sitting up there and we could follow him back there and get it ourselves. We politely declined and made our way back down the trail as quickly as we could with him following us on the trail several feet behind. He followed us all the way back to our car and she showed me her cell phone when I opened her door. I haven't been back to that particular trail since. It was definitely one of the more creepier moments of my life. Hey everyone, tonight we're back with another tragic murder mystery from the woods. This one has it all, death, violence, and corruption. So you know, viewer discretion is advised. 
we'll be discussing a triple homicide from 1960 where the suspected killer was ultimately cleared of all charges after many years of declaring his innocence. There's police corruption, the mishandling of evidence, conspiracy theories, and a few puzzling inconsistencies. Where did all of this occur, you ask? Well, that would be the Starved Rock State Park. It's located along the Illinois River in LaSalle County and is considered one of the state's most beautiful locations. This vast stretch of land covers over 2,300 acres and it became an official state park in 1911. Its popular attractions feature waterfalls, 13 miles of trails, and 18 canyons with walls made of moss-covered St. Peter sandstone formed by glacial meltwater. According to the park's website, humans have inhabited the area since way back to 8,000 BC, and its name is derived from a Native American legend of injustice and retribution. Chief Pontiac of the Ottawa tribe was slain by a rival tribe's warrior while attending a council meeting. Multiple battles followed and other tribes became involved. The Potawatomi were allies of the Ottawa, and during one particular battle, they found themselves seeking refuge atop the 120-foot sandstone butte we now call Starved Rock. We call it that because the Potawatomi were instantly surrounded. They remained trapped until each succumbed to a slow, painful death from starvation. But enough about that. Let's get into this story that's been 60 years in the making. First, a little bit about our victims. Francis Murphy... Mildred Lindquist and Lillian Uting, the three women, were close friends, all married to successful Chicago businessmen and heavily involved in their local Presbyterian church. They supported one another through life's hardships, such as when Lillian was nursing her husband back to health after a heart attack. Though entering their later years, they were all physically fit and healthy for their ages. It was in March of 1960 when they decided to take a three-day girls' trip to Starved Rock State Park, but sadly it was a trip they would never return from. They booked two hotel rooms upon arrival, dropped off their luggage, and went to the dining room for lunch. They were noticeably in good spirits and expressed to the staff how happy they were with the accommodations, all the while completely unaware of the devastating blow soon to come or the lasting effects it would have on their community. Deciding the snow was light enough to be easily traversed, the three ladies set out for a quick hike towards St. Louis Canyon with cameras in hand. They wound their way through ravines and 20-foot drops while traveling through the slippery, narrow canyon trail until it finally arrived at the end, which was marked by an 80-foot wall on three sides. This area is only one mile away from their accommodations, but it was days later before searchers finally reached their remains. The first sign of something gravely amiss was when Lillian Uting failed to call her husband as planned. George Uting tried to contact his wife at the lodge only to be told that she was unavailable and utterly unaware of Lillian's actual situation, he simply went to sleep. The following morning was a Tuesday and he tried again, only to be told she was busy. Again, no alarm bells were rung and a message was left on Lillian's door, the exact wording of which is unknown. George called the other husbands to update them on the situation, but he didn't yet see the reason to call authorities. On Wednesday, he tried again, this time pushing for the employee to check the women's room, and sure enough, there was not a single sign of them. Their beds were unmade, and their luggage was still there. Clearly a distressing sign. By this point, the women had been missing for over 40 hours, and due to police continuously brushing aside concerns from the worried husbands, eight more hours would pass before the search would actually begin. Tragically, the search party would quickly discover the bodies of all three women lying side by side in St. Louis Canyon. Two had their wrist bound with twine and their bruised legs spread. The binoculars were broken, the camera was dented, and four inches of snow had obliterated any tracks that may have been left behind. The only other clue seemed to be a bloodied yard-long log left nearby. The weather had considerably worsened as additional snow and ice covered the already narrow trails, making gathering evidence all the more difficult. Six inches of snow coated the ground where the remains lay, and to reach them, authorities were forced to bring in heavy tanks of liquid petroleum gas to burn away the top layer of snow very slowly. Though there was a risk of damaging vital evidence, it was a risk they deemed worth taking. Sources vary on what was found there. 
But among the evidence found beneath the snow was a piece of tin foil and blood stains. Though, don't forget, this was 1960, so that means much less than it would today. The twine used on the two victims was the same as the one found in the lodge's kitchen, and Frances was the only one with additional binds around her ankles. There are differing accounts of how many were assaulted, but these two also had clothing left askew to indicate the worst. Lillian and Mildred had removed their underwear and pants, while all three women's clothing was damaged, and their coats were placed between their legs. While the evidence was collected at the scene, other investigators began checking up on the known sex offenders in the area, though it didn't take them very far. It would be months before an arrest was made. After pathologists had state crime lab officials carefully removed the bodies, the autopsies occurred at the Hulse Funeral Home in Ottawa. Each was covered in blood. Their skulls were smashed and their faces were considerably bruised. The bloody tree stump was the suspected murder weapon, as the fatal injuries were made through blunt force trauma to the head. Eight pieces of evidence were found, and we'll be discussing those a little bit more. For now, just know the many images on Mrs. Murphy's camera were processed, but there was no sign of their murderer. Just three lovely women enjoying a seemingly wonderful vacation. The motive behind the brutal attack was unclear. Robbery was thought to be a possibility, however it was disregarded when the women's valuables were discovered with the bodies. On the surface, Chester Wegger seems like a perfect criminal to connect with in this case. At the time of the murders, he was 21 years old with a wife and two kids. Plus, he had a bad boy image straight out of the 1950s. Though he worked as a dishwasher at the Starred Rock Lodge for a time, some sources have differing accounts as to whether he was still employed there at the time of the murders, or if he was currently working in the family business, painting with his father. What drew attention to him were the two prior incidents in which he was suspected of sexual assault. The first instance occurred when Wegger was 12, and the victim was an 8-year-old girl. The second incident happened the previous year in 1959. In this latter case, not only was he later identified by the victim and her boyfriend, the crime occurred remarkably close to the site of our current murders. When questioning the suspect's colleagues, police learned Wegger came to work with a fresh scratch mark on his face. The source of the scratches were unknown, but Wegger insisted they were from shaving. As for his whereabouts at the time of the murders, he claimed to be writing letters in his basement, an impossible alibi to confirm, but also a contradiction to his last story. It would also seem he failed the polygraph, but let's keep in mind that those aren't foolproof. While these do sound like legitimate causes for suspicion, we must remember the authorities were under considerable pressure to find the killer. This was a very high-profile case at the time. Not only were three prominent women brutally murdered, the town was terrified. When things like this happen in smaller communities, it affects everyone. Even the economy suffers. With all of these factors in place combined with the era, I mean, Miranda warnings weren't even a thing yet, there's room for consideration. Is Wegger a cold-blooded killer or the victim of a corrupt police force eager to solve a crime? Well, it should be known that he always maintained his innocence. He maintained it for weeks before enduring an interrogation that lasted for over 24 hours. Throughout his extended period of questioning, Wegger was supposedly threatened with electric chair, a gun, and of course, this in addition to his claims of being beaten during his initial arrest, didn't help him at all. Still, after his life felt threatened, he signed a confession, claiming responsibility for the deaths of the three women in the robbery gone wrong. Then, almost immediately after, he formally recanted the confession. Unfortunately, we can't see the interrogation for ourselves to know the truth. It seems all we'll ever really have is hearsay, so we better hear it all. Some sources also mention this confession involved Wegger taking police to the crime scene and reenacting the murders. Did the officers also force him to write that he saw a red and white plane fly overhead after killing the women? Because flight records did indicate this to be a true statement. It's also true that Wegger's jacket had human blood splatter on it. Further, if you recall his original alibi, there were no witnesses to corroborate him being in his home in the basement. Perhaps that's why his story changed repeatedly. The only detail to remain constant was his innocence. Eventually, he produced a more substantial alibi. He claimed to be getting a haircut at the time of the murders, which others did attest to. 
While these discrepancies seem incredibly convenient, we should also remember this was several years after the actual events occurred and memories are fragile. Regardless of these loose ends, Wegger's claims of innocence fell on deaf ears, and he was still convicted, not just for the deaths of Mildred Linquist or Francis Murphy. On March 3, 1961, Chester Wegger was found guilty for the murder of Lillian Uting, and he was sentenced to life in prison a month later on April 3rd, thanks to one lone juror. Wegger was also spared the death penalty despite the popular opinion thinking that he should get it. This left many upset that he would eventually be eligible for parole. Meanwhile, he served his time at the Illinois State Penitentiary and Pickneyville Correctional Center as one of their longest serving inmates in history. Over the course of his sentence, he was ultimately denied parole more than 20 times before it was finally granted in November 2019. It wasn't denied due to poor behavior or anything like that, but because he refused to show remorse and maintained his innocence for the duration of his sentence. When the Illinois Prisoner Review Board granted Wager's parole with a 9-4 vote, his family cried tears of relief. Those who voted for his relief noted, Wager's age, fragile health, lengthy incarceration, and lack of disciplinary action during his sentence. After the decision was announced, one of the victim's granddaughters crossed the crowded Springfield board office with tears. She embraced Wager's younger sister, Mary Pruitt, stating she always believed in her brother's innocence. Contrastly, Diane Uting, the granddaughter of Lillian, also present that day, and she urged the board to keep Wager incarcerated but was not without sympathy for the man's family. Believe it or not, the two families spent much time together throughout the legal process and became somewhat of friends. At the hearing, Diane said, While we may not agree with the decision, we certainly respect it. Per the Attorney General's request, Wager was held for an additional 90 days after being granted parole. This was to provide time for an evaluation under the state's sexually violent persons law. This allows for civil commitment if a person is deemed too dangerous to be set free. But in Wager's instance, they did not believe that to be the case and he was released in February 2020. He was then sent to St. Leonard's House in Chicago, a facility where elderly former inmates can receive help becoming reaccustomed to life outside. Almost immediately upon his release, Wager was placed on a speakerphone with the press where he was quoted as saying, I'm happy. I'm happy just to get out, you know? Tell everybody that I said thank you. In a recent Rolling Stones article, a now 83-year-old Wager is quoted as saying, I'm innocent. I was innocent. I want to be vacated. He stayed with his sister and her husband in LaSalle, Illinois. Only one juror was still living at the time of his release, a 95-year-old who feared being named. She firmly believed Wager was guilty and may seek revenge on her. Though she has passed away since, sometime in 2016, the lone juror who refused to vote for the death penalty openly admitted to regretting her verdict of guilty. Now, if Wager's proclamations of innocence were all we had to go on, we wouldn't be putting much consideration into this theory. But there are actually some legitimate concerns to discuss. Do you remember those eight pieces of evidence I mentioned? Andy Hale, Wager's attorney, requested they be re-examined with modern technology. According to a 2022 Rolling Stones article, the defense team first tried this in 2004 but withdrew their motion upon learning evidence had been stored improperly and potentially was corrupted. In 2007, they petitioned the governor for clemency, but you won't be surprised to hear that it was denied. It was only recently they decided to try again. Though initially denied at first, the team's second attempt was approved and the results were tremendous. Despite prosecutors having previously described the evidence as a complete mess, Hale was surprised to find everything properly stored and neatly labeled. Unfortunately, only one item was actually able to be tested for reliable results, but it was still a massive break in the case. The hair found on one of the women's gloves was from a male, and it was not Wager. Hale hopes this will be enough to make his case directly to the state's attorney and receive permission to compare the new DNA analysis to the CODIS database. If a new match could be found, this case may have a different resolution shortly. By now, you may be wondering who else could or would be able to subdue and murder these three healthy women. And that's where this case gets even trickier. Now, we're going to dive into some alternative theories. It is admittedly a little difficult to believe that one man, while apparently on his lunch break, assaulted and murdered three women. 
dragged their bodies away and cleaned himself up in well enough time to return to work with no more than a few scratches on his face. At the very least, one would expect him to have some sort of help. Pending our source, it was either 1982 or 1983 when an elderly woman made a deathbed confession to Chicago Police Sergeant Mark Gibson stating she and her friends were responsible for the three women's deaths. In 2006, he described the confession in an affidavit. The elderly woman had been at the park with her friends when things got out of hand. She could say people were murdered and the victim's bodies were dragged, but that's as far as she got. The interview came to a sudden halt when the suspect's daughters intervened, saying their mother had lost her mind. There was no mention of further investigation into her claims and this theory quickly went cold. Three other men were suspects at some point. Two were reportedly overheard referring to the murders on the phone and the third was allegedly seen throwing a pair of bloodied overalls. Lastly, and my favorite, even if there isn't any evidence to support the claim, there is a theory that these murders were tied to the Mafia. These women were the wives of wealthy Chicago businessmen, after all. Who knows what their husbands may have really been into. I know it's a little out there, but hey, it's the cases where you have to consider every possibility, you know? The media sensationalized this case and changed the town's culture. It went from being a kind place where everybody left their doors unlocked to the type of place where everyone ensured their windows were locked at all times, their sense of security was tarnished, and nobody felt safe. Headlines included shocking titles such as Triple Killer Tells All and Starved Rock Confession. The once peaceful park was suddenly referred to as the Canyon of Death, and people went to great length just to avoid the area. The lodge went from regularly booking rooms to barely being filled, and the community was split as to whether Wager was innocent or guilty. HBO even made a docuseries about the case called The Murders of Starved Rock which ends on a note of mystery just before the DNA results were returned. With so much recent activity in the case, perhaps they're waiting for enough material to have a second season. And there we have it. The Starved Rock State Park Murders. So, what do you think? Is Chester Wager an innocent man who finally gained his freedom? Or a sadistic killer? Do you believe his confession was purely motivated by a corrupt police force? Is there any theory you believe in more than the others? Let me know in the comments. The Whispering Pines Event by Anonymous I've always been drawn to the tranquility and beauty of the great outdoors. So I decided to become a park ranger in a small, rural state park known as Whispering Pines. Nestled deep in the heart of the dense forest, the park was a haven for hikers and nature enthusiasts alike. Little did I know it was also a haven for something much darker and more sinister. I had heard the rumors about Whispering Pines long before I accepted the job. People talked of strange occurrences, eerie voices in the wind, and shadowy figures that wandered through most of the night. Most dismissed it as superstitious nonsense, but I couldn't help but be intrigued by the stories. I figured it probably all was just down to local legend, and I was determined to prove the skeptics wrong. My first few weeks as a park ranger were actually quite peaceful. I spent my days patrolling the serene trails and ensuring the safety of visitors. The park seemed like any other with the rustling leaves and the chirping of birds providing a soothing backdrop to my working environment. But as the days turned into weeks and summer transitioned into fall, I noticed oddities I couldn't quite explain. One chilly evening, I was finishing my rounds when I heard it for the first time. A soft, haunting whisper carried on the breeze, just barely audible over the sound of my footsteps. I stopped dead in my tracks trying to make out the words. The voice, it sounded distant and mournful, as if it were calling out to me from the shadows. My heart raced as I scanned the darkening forest, but no one was in sight. I brushed off the experience as a trick of the wind, but the whispers continued to haunt my nights in the park. I heard them when I was alone in my cabin, their ethereal tones seeping through the wooden walls. They echoed through the trees as I walked the trails, making me feel like I was being watched at every moment. The park that had once felt like my home now 
now seems like a foreign, foreboding place. As the whispers grew louder, other strange occurrences began to take place. I stumble upon ancient, weathered totems and symbols etched into trees. They seem to have no rhyme or reason, but their presence sent shivers down my spine. The wildlife, once abundant, started to slowly disappear, leaving an eerie silence in its wake. The park's beauty had turned into a nightmarish landscape. One moonless night, as I patrolled the park alone, the atmosphere grew thick with an oppressive darkness. I knew I wasn't alone, and the fear gnawing at me for weeks finally erupted. I could hear footsteps that weren't mine, rustling leaves that couldn't be attributed to the wind, and the chilling laughter of children echoing through the trees. But when I shone my flashlight into those dense undergrowth areas, no one was ever there. Dread settled in as I realized that the stories of whispering pines were not just tales but a living nightmare. It was as if the forest had come alive and evil forces intent on driving me away were just tormenting me. But I was a park ranger, dedicated to my duty and I couldn't abandon my post of course. I began researching the park's history, searching for clues about its dark past. It was then that I stumbled upon an old dusty journal hidden in the back of the ranger station. This was a diary that belonged to a former park ranger, and its entries chronicled a descent into madness. The ranger wrote of the whispers, the symbols, and the strange figures that had tormented him until he had disappeared without a trace. Terrified by what I had read, I knew I had to confront whatever dark presence dwelled within the whispering pines. Armed with the knowledge from the journal, I ventured deeper into the park, following the whispers to a long-forgotten clearing. There, I found a circle of weathered stones, their surfaces etched with symbols that matched those I had discovered on the trees. As I stood in the circle center, the whispers grew more insistent. The shadows around me seemed to take form, merging into a group of ghostly children. They giggled and sang songs from a bygone era, their voices filled with otherworldly sorrow. I knew I had to do something to break the curse that had plagued Whispering Pines for centuries. With trembling hands, I recited the words from the journal, calling upon the spirits to release their hold on the park. The children's laughter turned to cries, and the symbols on the stones began to glow in an eerie light. The ground trembled and the forest came alive with a furious wind. In a blinding flash, the spirits were gone and Whispering Pines fell silent. The whispers faded and the symbols on the trees vanished leaving the park in an eerie calm. I knew that I had done something. I don't know if it was what I needed to do, but that experience taken a whole toll on me. I don't know how much of it was hallucination from being overly tired or just from being incredibly anxious, but I do know that this was not my imagination. Whispering Pines was once a place of beauty and serenity to me, but it's been forever changed in my eyes. I confronted the darkness that lurked within. I had survived to tell the tale, but the memory of that night, it'll forever haunt that state park for me. It'll never leave my mind, my memory. It's forever etched in there. But let me remind you, there is a constant reminder of otherworldly forces that can exist even in the most tranquil of places. The Yellowstone Cult by Skazbaum For this story specifically, it is necessary to explain the general area that this happened in for this event. I live next to Yellowstone National Park, which in itself has drawn millions of tourists a year for who knows how long. Part of the reason I am writing this is a warning to people who decide to visit during the summer months. A couple of years ago, in the summer of 2020, some of my buddies decided to have a night out and do some camping out near a spot we had been to multiple times. After all, this was right after things started to become normal again and lockdowns were starting to become lifted. I headed up to the camp spot early to make sure my gear was still set up from earlier that day. I did this to reserve the place because it's first come, first serve. Therefore, with everything in hand, I left my house right before sunset. We were all supposed to meet up within the hour, so I didn't have any concerns about being by myself. I then began my 30 minute drive up to the location, 
When I finally arrived, I immediately noticed my tent and everything inside was gone. Now for some context, I staked the tent down in multiple areas to be sure it stayed for the period I was gone. Inside was my sleeping bag and a few other miscellaneous items I just left over to keep it weighted down. However, everything, literally everything, disappeared as if it was never there. I looked around and even the stakes and rocks placed outside were missing. I immediately knew something was wrong because I did not see any campers on the way up either. Also remember, I do not have cell service as it's a few miles back into the wilderness. I then decided to drive back down from where I came to get assistance, get a hold of my friends, and let them know what happened. Last, I was unhappy with the situation and knew that whoever had taken my belongings had to still be in the area as they had only been there for about an hour or two. However, my friends insisted that I stay and at least hang out a few hours and honestly, it took weeks of planning so I, I caved and I stayed. Once I made sure everyone arrived, I decided to go around the area in search of any sign of footprints or indication that these people were close by. And as you can guess, I wasn't able to find anything. I eventually played it off and decided to look for it in the morning and contact the forest service to report it missing. I also didn't want to ruin the party for everyone else and decided to stay. In hindsight, this was one of the worst decisions I could have ever made. As the night went on, everything seemed fine. So I thought. Around 1 or 2 in the morning, most of my friends called it a night. I ended up sleeping in my truck. This was perhaps one of the better decisions that I made that night. Always bringing my bear spray and a sidearm for protection from unexpected guests. I eventually fell asleep. However, it was important to note that I was still a bit on edge as it was only a couple of hours before all of my belongings got taken. I decided to leave my window rolled down just a little bit just in case if I could hear anything creep up on us in the middle of the night. After about two hours of being asleep, my worst nightmare came true. At first, I just heard something moving around outside the perimeter of the camp. This was enough noise to wake me up and I immediately froze and didn't move. Therefore, this was partially because I knew whatever was making that noise had to be large, not just a raccoon or any smaller creature. I then was paralyzed and just listening intent to whatever was happening outside of my camp. My first thought that it had to be a bear, right? We had had sightings and reportings recently in the area. At one point, it could have only been 20 to 30 yards away. Also, another critical point I noticed was that there were no other noises. Usually there would be some sort of grasshopper or bird making a noise, but it was completely and utterly silent. Now, in the wilderness, that's never a good sign. It means there's a large predator or something in the area. Meanwhile, it was pitch black outside, and our fire had gone entirely out. After about 15 minutes of not hearing absolutely anything, I decided I just was... I was just being paranoid and I needed to stop. But as I was about to fall back asleep, I saw something to the right of our campsite. It was just a few yards away from our fire pit about 20 yards from me. To my absolute horror, it was a person. I immediately freaked out. This was no average person either, let alone the fact that it was 3 or 4 in the morning and you're in someone's campsite deep in the wilderness. This person was wearing what I only made out to be some kind of mask. I got a perfect look at whoever this was. It was a deer skull on their face. They were wearing a black robe, and that's about all I got to notice. I didn't want to leave my truck and confront this person, so I did what I thought was best. I turned on my truck and began honking the horn until all my friends were awake. I rolled down the window and told them we needed to leave immediately. After seeing what I saw, I did precisely that. Meanwhile, this person hasn't moved, mind you. Just as I thought it was terrible, the situation got even worse. More of these figures began appearing in front of us through the trees, wearing the same outfits, and I don't even know how to explain the mass. They were amalgamations of deer skulls and other animal skulls. I immediately put my truck into reverse and began speeding away like a bat out of hell. They began walking closer and closer, but luckily I could drive out of there just in the nick of time. As I began to speed down the road out of there, Three more figures appeared from the side of my truck, this time with a dog, and they were way more aggressive than the previous ones I saw. They began throwing rocks and sticks and chasing after me. At one point, they were right next to my passenger window until I accelerated a bit more and eventually lost them. Looking back in my mirror, I only saw one figure left, just simply peeking and staring at me behind a tree. 
The image is forever seared into my head. From that night on, I refuse to ever go back up there. I've never spoken to anyone about this. Even when I was around friends who experienced similar things, I never really mentioned it. It's been over a year now since this happened, and well, all I can say is that I believe these people were in some sort of cult. I've heard other stories about similar happenings happening around Yellowstone. Apparently cattle completely disappear. Apparently fences are completely removed. It's just very odd and weird happenings like this that aren't necessarily explainable, but apparently there are these weird cults that are doing it. I don't know what you guys believe, but I've seen it for myself. There is something wrong with Anastasia State Park by Saraya G. I was feeling adventurous and decided to explore the Anastasia State Park independently. I had heard it was beautiful, with stunning ocean views and dense forests. The day was perfect for an outdoor adventurer like myself, with the sun shining and a gentle breeze blowing. However, as I began my journey, I noticed how quiet it really was around me. The only sounds I could hear were the rustling of leaves under my feet and the occasional bird making some sort of chirping sound. I walked for a couple of hours, taking in the breathtaking scenery around me. But as the sun started to set, I realized I had lost track of time and honestly had no idea where I had ended up. I tried to retrace my steps as best as I could, but every direction I turned seemingly looked the same. I started to feel anxious and got a bit scared. The forest had become dark and the silence had been peaceful earlier, but now it almost seemed deafening. The rustling of leaves now sounded like footsteps behind me. I tried my best to stay calm. I tried to call out for help, but my voice echoed through the trees without any response. Then, the forest darkness started to play tricks on my mind, and I could swear I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. My heart was racing, and I started to run, hoping to find my way back to civilization. But as I ran, the forest only seemed to get darker and more ominous. I could hear strange noises and whispers, but couldn't quite make out what they were saying. I stumbled upon an abandoned cabin after some time, and my relief was only short-lived as I noticed the door was slightly ajar. As I pushed the door open, the smell of decay filled my nostrils. I could see that the cabin had not been inhabited for quite some years, but I noticed fresh blood on the walls. I knew I had to leave and I had to get out of there fast. I ran out of that cabin and into the darkness of the forest once more. I could hear the footsteps behind me again, and I knew that I was being pursued. I tripped and fell, and as I looked up, I saw the shadowy figure looming over me. The last thing I remember was the sound of my screams echoing through the forest as I was dragged away into the darkness. I woke up like quite some hours later, I couldn't tell you how long it was, disoriented and completely confused in the woods and with no memory of how I got there or what happened. To this day, I have never returned to Anastasia State Park, and I don't think I ever will. It took me quite a few hours to finally figure out where I was during the daytime hours, and luckily, I was able to follow a trail of smoke from a local campfire, so eventually I did find help. I will never, ever return to that area though. The memory, it still haunts me at night, and I've learned to never underestimate the dangers of exploring unknown territories alone, but I really don't know what happened to me that night. Wh whatever that shadow was, I don't know. Why I Quit My Job as a Park Ranger by Turbo Baker 67 I've been a park ranger for over 15 years, and I've seen some pretty strange things in my time. But nothing could have prepared me for what I saw that night in the state park. It was late, and I was making my rounds, checking the various campsites and hiking trails. That's when I stumbled upon the remains of a dead bear. It looked like I had been mauled by something much bigger and more powerful. I took a few pictures to document the scene and send it to the higher-ups for investigation. The last thing we needed was a giant cannibal bear around. As I was about to leave the area, something caught my eye. A shadowy figure moving in the trees nearby just out of my line of sight. I figured it had to be some deer or something like that, so I approached slowly, trying not to startle it. But as I got closer... I realized this indeed was no deer, it was something much more grotesque. 
It had the body of a man but the face of a bear. Its eyes glowed a bright red, and its teeth were long and sharp. It was covered in thick, matted fur and smelled like death. I froze in terror as the creature began to growl and snarl. I knew I had to leave, but my legs just wouldn't carry me away. It was like they were rooted to that spot. That's when the creature charged at me. I tried to run, but it was far too fast. It tackled me to the ground, and I felt its hot breath on my face. I thought I was going to die right then and there. But as fast as it had attacked me, it ran into the woods, leaving me shaken and scared. I don't know why. As I tried to collect myself and the radio for backup, I, I, I couldn't help but feel like something was watching me. Like this thing wasn't actually gone, you know? The feeling of being followed just never left me, even as I drove away from that state park. I tried to shake it off as just my nerves, but something about the encounter with that creature had left a deep mark on me. Over the next few days, I dug into the park's history to find any records of strange sightings or reports of animals acting oddly. That's when I stumbled upon an old newspaper article from the mid-1950s. It talked about a group of loggers who had gone missing in the woods never to be seen again. The article described how some loggers had reported seeing some strange creatures with a man's body and a bear's face in the woods before disappearing. I couldn't even believe what I was reading. Was it possible that the creature I had encountered was the same thing that had been reported all those years ago? Or maybe it was just one of his children or something? I knew I had to investigate further to figure this out. So I did return to that area where I had seen the creature, armed with a camera and a flashlight. I searched the woods for hours to find evidence of its existence. That's when I stumbled upon a cave. It was hidden behind a large boulder. I would have missed it if I hadn't paid more attention. I cautiously approached the cave, shining my flashlight inside. What I saw made my blood run cold. The cave was littered with bones, some of them clearly human. The air was thick with the stench of death, and I could hear something breathing deep within the darkness. I knew I had to get out of there before this thing would get me and not spare me like it did before. As I turned to leave, I swear I, I just had this feeling of being watched all over again. As I began to turn to leave, something grabbed my ankle. I fell to the ground and my flashlight flew out of my hand. I could feel something trying to pull me back into the cave, dragging me towards the darkness. I fought with all my strength, kicking and screaming, and eventually I was able to break free and run from the cave. The only thing I lost in that process was one of my hiking boots. I stumbled into the daylight, gasping for air. I never turned back, I never looked back, and I never even went back to that state park. I, I quit right then and there on the spot, and I left. And I forever will feel this deep dread. I, I was just lucky enough to make it out alive. Twice. To this day, I still wonder what that creature is. Whether it's still out there in the woods waiting for its next victim. And where it even came from. I'm a park ranger who's seen my fair share of horrible things. By Horror Writer 1717. I'm a park ranger who's seen my share of horrible things. Somewhere along the line, being a park ranger became a lot more complicated than riding around in a truck, giving people directions, and checking fishing licenses. I can point to one event that started me down the road to losing my naivety, to becoming something more. I never used to believe in cryptids, Bigfoot, the Loch Ness Monster, Skinwalkers, and all that stuff. They were just things of dreams, creepypastas, and things that salesmen looking to cash in on those who didn't know any better. At the time, I was working at a park with beautiful mountains and rivers and lakes to enjoy. The park itself was massive, miles upon miles of forest separated by single roads running through the middle. It was a hiker's dream and a ranger's nightmare. There were many pull-offs with incredibly scenic views that people would take advantage of. If I could have charged a nickel for every car pulled over to take a picture, I would have been a millionaire years ago. If I had been given a bonus every time I had to help rescue a hiker that went off the trail and got lost or fell over the edge of a ravine, I'd have quite a nest egg too. But that's, that's the job. You take the good with the bad, and the bad can get downright horrible. I was walking a trail, as rangers are supposed to do, and came across a campsite. It was nothing spectacular, five tents set up in a clearing just off the trail. It seemed odd right away though, because all the tents were zippered up. Being almost noon, I didn't think hikers out here this far would be the kind to lay in a tent for half the day. 
so I cleared my throat loudly and announced that I was a park ranger and wanted to see if they needed any assistance. The sounds of the forest were the only answer I got back. I announced myself again, hoping to see a head pop out of one of the tents and say they were okay, and to tell me to bug off, but that didn't happen. Finally, I knocked on one of the tents and asked if everything was okay. Receiving no answer, I slowly unzipped the tent. The inside was immaculate and tidy. Everything was folded and in its place. Food was sealed up and a sleeping bag was laid on the ground. It looked like someone had gotten up early, tidied their tent to go for a stroll. I checked the other tents and they were the exact same way. No mess, no sign of anything wrong. I put my hand over the embers of the charred wood in the fire ring. It was warm as if someone had only used it a couple of hours prior. It was an unseasonably warm October day. The sun was shining brightly overhead, and the temperatures were already in the 70s. I had brought my jacket but left it in the truck back at the trailhead, never thinking I would need it on a beautiful day like today. After checking the tents and finding them all in order, I resealed them and went on my way. At the time, I saw no need for an alarm. The scene looked like a group who had gone hiking for the day. I continued down the trail, enjoying the sunshine and watching for anyone needing help. Hours later, I came through on the path somewhat mystified. This was one of our most popular trails, yet I hadn't seen a single soul on it the entire day. It was odd, but still nothing I needed to report or raise any concern about. I returned to the camp only to find it in the same condition I'd left it. I knocked on one of the tents again and got no answer. I opened one up and found everything as I had left it. It was getting close to sundown and I was concerned that the campers were nowhere to be found. The campsite was high up and you could see from quite a bit from there. The trail split on one side and went to a river while the other side dead-ended after somewhat tricky climbs over to an overlook that ended on a cliff. I was concerned for the campers and would have felt much better if they had been back at their camp. Visions of one of them sliding down into the ravine and the other four trying to rescue them danced through my head. I reached for my radio but decided against it. I walked the rest of the way back to the trailhead to see if there were cars. The group might have decided to go for breakfast or lunch and decided to leave their gear out here. I found four cars in my ranger truck when I got to the trailhead. Now I was starting to worry. I called it in on my radio and gave descriptions and license numbers, just in case. They all came back as being registered to local kids in their 20s. They had a weekend camping trip with a group of friends. The only thing that was missing, though, was that that group of friends. Where could they be? I checked that thought, hoping they weren't missing. I grabbed my jacket and flashlight from the truck since the setting sun had already dropped the temperature several degrees. Then I went back down to the trail, looking for any clues from where these kids could have gone. As I approached the campsite, I mentally crossed my fingers that they would all be sitting around the campfire and chuckling at the silly ranger who thought they were lost. That didn't happen. By the time I got back to their campsite, it was nearly dark. I rechecked the tents, this time looking more closely for clues where they might have gone. But if they left anything behind to hint at their whereabouts at all, I didn't find it. I called in on the radio and reported that the group hadn't returned to their site. The ranger I talked to was also concerned. Just like in many other parks, there were wild animals that roamed around. I thought they could have fallen victim to one. There would have at least been a sign of a struggle though, right? But when I walked the trail earlier, I hadn't seen anything. Suddenly, the nightly sound ceased. All the animals, the insects chirping, walking, and raising a racket in the forest went silent. It was terrifyingly still. My senses went on high alert. I shone my flashlight around the campsite and the forest beyond, but I couldn't see anything but trees. As I scanned the area with my light, I looked around a bit more, then heard a soft footstep behind me. I tried to understand which direction it was coming from and what was making the sound. As I searched, my hand found the can of pepper spray on my belt and I pulled it out. Instinctively, I shook the can and held it ready in case a bear or some other predator appeared out of the woods with less than friendly intentions. My light drifted as I waited to hear another sound. The silence was oppressive. My breathing was so loud it nearly made up for the loss of any animal sounds. I listened to another step and another. I tried to focus on it, but I couldn't see anything. The steps weren't getting closer or farther away. They seemed to be circling me. I was being stopped. I wanted to use my radio, but that meant putting down the flashlight or the pepper spray. I didn't want to sacrifice light or defense. I decided to switch things up and go on the offense. 
I stepped towards the last place I heard the footsteps. I wasn't being quiet about it either. I tromped on the leaves, broke sticks, and generally let whatever it was known that I was coming. I'm not sure if that was the most brilliant move, but I wanted to get the stalker out of the stalking mode and put it on the defensive. I didn't hear any more footsteps. Of course, that could have been because I was making a racket of my own. The tree line approached rapidly, and I was forced to make a decision. Do I continue into the trees and lose visibility, or do I stay in the false safety of the clearing? I knew in the back of my mind that this was a predator bent on making me its prey. There was no safety. I stood at the edge of the clearing and waited. I could hear a faint sound of breathing. It was slow and deep. Whatever was out there was a big, but it wasn't moving. We stood there in our silent standoff, unsure of what the other would do. Waiting was not to my advantage, though. If this thing had done something to the campers, there was no reason to think it wouldn't do the same to me. Out here in the middle of nowhere, where even light was scarce, there was no safety against a creature with unknown intentions. I felt the thing move. There was a whisper of a breeze. I knew it was coming. I aimed my pepper spray in the sound's direction and sprayed a burst. For a moment there was silence and then suddenly an exhale. It was much closer than I had thought. I aimed where it had been and sprayed for another burst. This time, there was a definite reaction. It let out a terrifying roar so close I felt the wind and smelled the stench of death from it. I risked spraying back and forth over the area where I thought it was. Every nerve in my body was screaming for me to run, but I kept pouring, starting to cough myself from the cloud of chemicals that blew back on me when it roared. The roar stopped at the same time the can sputtered. I stood defenseless. I didn't dare run. That was like the sounding of a dinner bell. I threw the can toward the creature with exhausted pepper spray, grabbed my radio and called for help. I'm out here on Beggar's Trail where I found those abandoned tents, I said quickly, not knowing how many seconds it would take until the creature attacked. I've come across an unidentified predator. What kind of predator? The ranger answered back. I rolled my eyes wondering about the word unidentified. She didn't understand. I'm not sure I didn't get a look at it. Is there any sign of the campers? None, I said. It's like they've up and vanished. No sign of a struggle, but this predator showed me a clue of what might have happened. Are you safe? No. Then get out of there, and we'll get together a search party in the morning. Roger that, I said, not having to be told twice to leave this place. I backed away from the edge of the woods, never taking my eyes off the tree line. Once I returned to the camp, I turned and started walking fast towards the trail. I said walking, but it was more of a, a walking run, a power walk, if you will. I didn't want to break into an entire run, even though my mind was screaming at me to get the hell out of there as fast as possible. I power walked down the trail, keeping my senses alert and my eyes darting back and forth between both sides of the course. It didn't do much good to look anyway. My flashlight lit up the middle of the trail and the sides were dominated by shadows that danced and jumped as my flashlight moved. This didn't help me out of panic mode either. After a few minutes, I thought I heard something in the wood behind me. I spun around for a glance, but never stopping my momentum, nearly tripping on a branch across the trail. After that, I stopped looking back, but I was sure I heard something back there. I upped my pace to the fastest walk possible. I could see the trailhead looming ahead of me. I knew from watching horror movies that this was the time when the victim was often caught. Right when they were approaching safety, I threw everything to the wind and ran the last hundred yards to the truck. I threw myself in and started it in one smooth motion. I honestly don't remember putting it in drive, stomping on the gas, and doing more than 180 all the way down the road. I slammed on the brakes on the first turn and glanced back in the rearview mirror. I swear I saw a set of red glowing eyes staring at me. I didn't know if they were red because of the brake lights or not, but I didn't really care to find out. When I was a mile down the road, I eased off the gas and tried to get my breathing back to a normal pace. I tried to think about why I had been so scared. I had no proof that this animal wanted to hurt me, or that it had anything to do with the missing campers, but still something was nagging in the back of my mind telling me that if I had not gotten out of there, I would not be alive right now to share this story. I briefly stopped at the ranger station to talk to the ranger on duty, then went home to get some sleep. I knew tomorrow was going to be a long day. When I returned to the station the following morning after a very short and restless night, there were already more cars there than usual. I walked into the head ranger, 
talking about the search party. I was assigned to the leading group since I was the first on the scene. I wasn't sure how I really felt about that. Of course, it made me proud that I would be picked to be leading the group, but I also had reservations about returning to that campsite. I was sure that I had dodged a bullet last night, and I wasn't sure how many more chances like that I would get before my luck ran out in this life. The head ranger gave me the floor, and I quickly reported yesterday's events. I left out the monster. I found out I was also assigned to the group that had a specialist, a tracker that had been brought in from another state just for the search. I was happy to have the help, hoping she would be able to find the campers while there was still something left to see. Before we left, I went to the storeroom, grabbed two extra cans of pepper spray, and replaced the one I had emptied yesterday. We then got to the trailhead, and the cars were all still there. I found it creepy, but I guess I would have been a bit freaked out if they were suddenly gone. It might have been a little bit more perplexing. It was interesting trying to fit an additional five vehicles in the parking lot that was designated to hold only six cars. I got out and put my backpack on as the rest of the team did the same. The rest of the group had idle chit chat, but I was quiet. I felt better because it was morning and light out, plus there were more people around me, but the nagging thought wouldn't go away. The campers had the same amount of people when they're gone. The tracker pulled out a map and laid it out on the hood of the car. We gathered around as she laid out the plan to split into two teams. She and I would check out the campsite while the other three rangers would continue on the trail searching for clues. We all headed out together. Once we got to the camp, the three others kept going while the tracker and I stayed behind. She paused and looked over the entire site, slowly panning from left to right. I stayed behind and kept quiet so as not to disturb her. As we moved into the campsite, she would often pause and look closely at the ground even lying down at one point and looking across the floor. When we had done a slow, methodical walkthrough, she paused and took a drink from her canteen. Did you find anything? I said, startling myself with the sound of my own voice. The birds and insects had began making noise, but we hadn't spoken since we had gotten out of our vehicles over a mile away. I didn't find any campers, if that's what you're asking, she said. No signs of a struggle. That's what I thought too, I replied unsure if I was qualified to exchange notes with the person or not. She stared at me for a long moment, making me wonder if I had offended her with my simple observation. How long ago were you here? She said. Around noon yesterday is when I first discovered the campsite. And what do you find odd about that? I looked around, not noticing anything odd but feeling like this was some pop quiz the teacher was pulling on me, and I hadn't studied. I did a full pass through, looking at everything but I did not see what she was looking for. Uh, I don't know, I finally admitted, slumping my shoulders. The tents, she said. They're still here, they're, they're still in perfect condition. I looked at the tents and thought, so what, she must have seen my confusion. There are bears and other animals in this park, correct? Uh, of course, I said, still not following. Don't you think they would have at least explored these tents looking for food? The light bulb went off. We weren't looking for just what happened. But what hadn't happened? Why wouldn't they? I said to myself. You reported that you heard a predator last night, right? I nodded, not liking where this was going. Where were you and where did you see it? She said. I hesitated, looking around the camp trying to get my bearings. It was over this way, I said, slowly stepping between the tents. I had just checked the tents for the second time when the birds and insects suddenly went silent. She stopped me. What? The birds stopped chirping and the insects stopped carrying on, I said. It was quite unnerving to be in such immediate and total silence. I'm sure, she said with a far off look. I looked around but didn't see anything, I said. Then I heard a footstep. Just one? Yeah, it was kind of creepy. What then? I started toward the sound, then heard more footsteps. I said as we walked toward the trees. They weren't coming toward me, they were more encircling me. Did you hear anything else? When I got close to the edge of the tree line, uh, I swear, I could hear, I could hear breathing. She stopped me as we came to the tree line. You were close enough to hear it breathe? I nodded. She looked me up and down as if seeing me for the first time. And you had no idea what it was? I didn't see anything with the light, and the roar was so loud it was hard to identify. It roared at you? After I sprayed it with pepper spray, she stared at me for a long moment. 
for an instant. She looked as though she wanted to say something but then went into the trees searching for tracks. I left her to do her thing and stood back to be out of her way. After circling several trees, she started more profound into the woods, seeming like she was following a path I could not see. Did you find something? I said quietly after we had gone a dozen yards into the forest. She nodded, not looking up. I couldn't resist the urge to ask. What, what was it? She stopped and turned toward me, looking several shades paler than before. You don't want to know. That's all she said. I looked around the forest that seemed to be closing in on me. I could feel the same fear grab me by the base of my spine like last night when I was power walking toward my truck. A am I lucky to be alive? I said, not needing the answer. Try not to think about it, she said without looking up. I spent the rest of the day doing just that. The more I tried not to think about it, the more I thought about it. We had started level when she was first on the invisible trail. However, as we went, the ground started to go more and more downhill toward an angle that became more of a steep downhill angle and eventually a treacherous downhill slide. We had to hang on to trees and dig our heels in so we wouldn't tumble down the hill. I could see the river below, but it was a good hundred yards to the bottom and there was no way to slide or roll without hitting several trees on the way down. If we slipped or lost our footing, there was no way we would not sustain severe, even life-threatening injuries. She led us down the invisible trail until we were halfway down the hill. Then she took a turn, and we cut straight across the mountain. I thought how much easier this was when my foot slipped, and I nearly tumbled down the hill. Luckily, I grabbed a sapling on my way down, and it halted my fall. She came down to me and helped me back up. I was about to say thank you when she put her finger to my lips. I took the hint and didn't say a thing. She pointed further along the trail and could see we were heading straight toward a cave. The river was louder now. We were a little closer. Because of that, I hadn't noticed the birds were no longer singing. She must have seen it too. She crawled over to another tree and sat against it, then slowly and quietly began covering herself with fallen leaves and loose brush to hide. Following her lead, I did the same thing. When we finished, I could barely see her. We sat there for a few minutes. I was desperately searching all around for anything moving. I quietly got one of the cans of pepper spray and held it at the ready. I knew the only reason it worked last night was that I had the element of surprise. If I sprayed whatever creature this was today, it might end up ripping off my arm. But at least I knew it worked once. As we sat there, I was starting to get antsy. I could feel ants crawling on me. I tried moving to slowly brush them away when I glanced over at her she glared at me. Once she had caught my eye, she slowly shook her head a minuscule amount, just enough for me to get the message and stop moving. It wasn't long after that I heard the footsteps again. This time, they weren't trying to be quiet. I could feel them in the ground. I tried looking toward the cave, but the leaves that camouflaged me also blocked most of my vision. I could only see a small patch of trees directly in front of me 20 feet away. In the end, that may have been for the best. I caught a small glimpse of the creature and didn't want to see the rest of it. If I had, I might have run away in terror, even though I was hidden. What I saw was massive. I was mystified how it could walk on the hillside without sliding down the river. That was the thought that kept me from panicking. How can this thing balance without sliding into the river? It was a stupid thought, but it kept me from freaking out. I held my breath as it walked past me. I, I don't know if it knew I was there and maybe it was just toying with me. I closed my eyes and waited for this thing to stop, turn, and lunge at me. A few minutes later, I was still waiting. I felt a hand on my shoulder, and it was all I could do to not scream. The tracker held her hand over my mouth until she knew I wouldn't yell. She motioned me to follow her, and we headed toward the cave. The whole time, I was shooting furtive glances over my shoulder, waiting for this thing to come back. When we got to the mouth of the cave, I tugged her on her shoulder. What if there's another one inside? I whispered. I felt her stiffen. We'll just have to go slow and see, she whispered back. We peeked around the edge of the entrance. I didn't see anything, but it was rather dark inside. There was no choice. We had to use our flashlights. If there was another creature in there, we would be revealing ourselves. I sighed deeply and turned on my flashlight, instantly regretting it. The cave was large. I could easily stand up in it It had several feet of headroom. In the center was a depression with the remains of burned pieces of wood together 
where there had been a fire at one point. But the real shock was when we shone our lights around. The walls of the cave were dark red, but not solid red. There were splatter marks all over. In one spot, a bloody handprint slid down the wall as if someone was trying to escape and was pulled back. My mind went wild, imagining the horrors that had gone on in this cave. I had not noticed the smell at first, probably because I was more worried about dying. But now that I did, it was a horrid stench. Rotting flesh combined with other bodily fluids and puddles on the floor made my stomach do flip-flops. I did everything I could do to not retch. I pulled my radio and called back to the station, giving them our GPS coordinates and telling them to have all teams converge at this location. Almost as an afterthought, I told them to bring a tranquilizer gun and shotguns loaded with slugs. The cavalry is on the way, I said. That's great, but don't you think we should find some bodies first? I looked around and she was correct. There was every piece of evidence pointing to there being bodies except actual bodies. We looked around, but there didn't seem to be any place to hide anything. She told her light ab She moved her light around, looking carefully at the walls when she suddenly found a passageway hidden due to the natural angle of the wall. We started back to the passageway. It was wide and tall. We could have easily walked side by side and still had room. When we got to the end, what we found... We unfortunately found what we were looking for. The passageway opened up into another room, a pile of dirt, leaves, and grass covered in the corner. It could have passed for a bed. In the other corner, there was a pile of bones. Beside it was clothing. Lots of clothing. I stepped over to the rise of clothes and dug through them, finding a pair of pants that still had a wallet. I pulled it out and checked the driver's license. It was a name I recognized. I think I may have found one of our hikers, I said. She didn't answer. I looked over, and she was shining her flashlight down into a hole in the floor. I may have found the rest. She said wide-eyed. I took my backpack off, put the wallet in it, and then went over to see what she was looking at. In the hole were more bodies. One of them was still moving, just barely. Help me. I heard a weak call come from one of them. We'll help you, I called down, leaning over the edge to go down into the hole. What are you doing? She grabbed me by the shoulder, pulling me back. I'm going to help. Look down there, she said, flashing her light into the hole. This has to be 15 feet deep. How are you planning on getting anyone out? They could never even reach the top, even if they stood on your shoulders. I looked down and realized she was absolutely right. Feeling helpless, I looked around the cave and then I had an idea. I went to the pile, pulled out my hunting knife and started cutting the clothes from the bones. I took two pairs of pants and then tied them together. Then I tied a shirt to them. We had made a makeshift rope at least 20 feet in length. We tossed the end into the hole and told her to grab on. We sat our flashlights down, aiming them at the spot and started pulling. But soon the rope gave way and we fell backward. What happened? The tracker said. I'm not strong enough to keep a hold, the woman in the hole said. Okay, tie it around your waist this time, I said. After a minute, she was ready. We pulled her again, but this time she didn't come loose halfway up. We got her to the top and untied her. She screamed at the top of her lungs. What's wrong? She pointed behind us, and there stood the creature. It was more hideous than anything I'd ever seen. It looked like someone had skinned a Bigfoot and gave it tusk. It was massive. It, it, its head. It nearly touched the ceiling of the cave. I pulled out my knife and can of pepper spray, but the creature moved impossibly fast and swiped them away. The can landed in the corner of a pile of bones. I watched helplessly as my knife clattered and then bounced into the hole. It came at me, slashing claws at the air, just missing my jugular. As I backpedaled, I stumbled, and then I was in the air. The ground came rushing up to smash me into the back, knocking the wind out of me. I looked up and realized I was in the hole. Before I could regain my breath, a body fell on top of me, evacuating my breath again. Not only could I not breathe, but I also couldn't see either. I had no idea as of which of the two women had fallen on top of me. It wasn't long until I found another body land on top of the pile, making the point moot. I was faced with a decision. Do I try to find my flashlight so I can at least see where I am in the condition of the woman, let alone where the creature is, or do I play dead? Again the decision was rendered moot as I heard another impact. This one wasn't the limp body thudding into a pile. This was a deliberate choice to land on two feet, paws, or whatever this thing had. The creature's breathing filled the room. 
It echoed back, making it sound like a herd of them that had surrounded me and closed in. There was no way for me to push the weight of the two bodies off of me without bringing attention to myself. I could hear the creature slowly circling. I had no idea how its night vision was, but I prayed it wasn't any better than mine. If it were waiting to hear me move, I would be as still as possible. The only exception was my hand slowly moving to the small flashlight in my pocket. I had no idea what help a flashlight would be at this point, but it was better than laying there waiting to die. The sounds of breaking bone punctuated the creature's footsteps. The fact that there was no cries of pain told me it was too late for everyone in this place. Once there, there was no escape, unless a couple of rangers blunder in and get you out, only to have the creature throw you right back in. In retrospect, that was quite a tease. Breathing quietly was becoming a problem. The weight of two bodies on me didn't help me. Fortunately, my fingers had reached the bottom of my pocket, and I grabbed the small flashlight. I slowly pulled it out, trying to be as silent as possible. In the end, it didn't matter when one of the women on top of me groaned. I heard the creature pause and then start in our direction. I knew it was now or never. I aimed the flashlight as best as I could while surrounded by darkness and, only using sound, it stepped right up to us and I could feel the weight lift off me. My relief was short-lived as I heard a sickening snap that could only be the sound of a neck breaking, followed by a thud of a body hitting the ground. Next, I heard a gasp as the body directly on top of me was lifted. I knew she was about to share the same fate. I turned on the flashlight and aimed it at the creature's face. Thankfully, it dropped her and roared in fear or pain. I moved away from that spot as quickly as possible and turned the light off before it could recover and track me down. Once again, silence reigned as it tried to listen to my movements, but I was still as a stone. I hadn't made it far, maybe a dozen feet before I shut off the light and froze. For a long moment, neither of us made a sound. It was unnerving. I held my breath, fearing even that would give it away. Then I heard it take a step. I locked in and turned on my light, hitting it in the face and making it roar again. The downside was it was not as far away as I wanted. It zeroed in on me quickly and charged. I turned off the light and dove to the side trying to run but tripping and falling over a pile of bones. I hit the ground hard with a solid thud that I knew would give away my position, not that it mattered. At this point it was so close all it had to do was reach out and tear me to pieces. I lay there waiting for death, listening to its labored breathing, and decided to at least see when the thing was coming to get me. I turned on my light and shone it at the creature. It didn't roar, it didn't move. What trick is this? I thought. I stood keeping my light on the creature the whole time. It was lying beside the wall of the cave. A significant dent in the wall looked just as if it were the same size as the top of its head. Apparently during the last charge it had rammed its head into the wall and knocked itself unconscious. I shined the light around the room, desperately searching through the carnage of human parts. When I saw a glint of metal, I followed the sight of my knife sticking out from the back of a victim. I recoiled in horror when I saw the level of decay of the corpse. My knife hadn't caused his death. I pulled the knife out of the corpse and hurried back to the creature. I knew there would be only a few seconds left for me to be able to kill it and maybe bring it back to somebody who would study it. But also, who would say it had every right to live as much as I had? I leaned down and slit its throat. Then I stabbed it repeatedly through the back and in different places, trying to hit as many vital organs as possible. I slashed and stabbed with every ounce of rage in me. I screamed as I turned the creature into a hamburger, and it still wasn't enough. Adrenaline surged as I dismembered this thing from the bowels of hell. Finally, I collapsed. I had no energy left, and I fell to the floor covered in blood and lay beside this thing. As my lungs heaved and screamed into the air, I heard a commotion in the cave above. Lights played along the walls. Lights invaded the cave. I could hear the gasp of shock and disgust as the other rangers saw what was down in the pit. With maximum effort, I slowly raised my arm. Over here! We've got a live one! I heard someone say. The clamoring of people trying to get into and out of the hole was all I heard as I looked around the now lit room and saw how many bodies littered the floor. They pulled me out and took me to a hospital. Just tell me it's dead, was all I could say according to witnesses. I wouldn't know. Everything from when they found me into the next day, waking up in a hospital bed was a blur. With a few fractured ribs and general exhaustion being my diagnosis, I was able to walk out in a couple of days. But before I did, there was one other survivor in the hospital I wanted to visit. The woman we pulled out of the pit was the only true survivor of the Cave of Horrors. She was in critical condition but expected to pull through. 
I talked to her. She was one of the hikers we were looking for. She told me they had decided to go for a walk on the trail when the creature took them one by one. It would sneak up behind them and grab them. Two of her friends were gone before she knew it. They searched all over but couldn't find them. So they started back and the creature took another from the end of the line. The last two were her and her boyfriend. It stalked them and took them at the same time. She squeezed my hand as tears flowed down her cheeks. I don't want to say anything about what happened in that cave, she said. I don't want to remember anything about it. She pulled me close and we hugged for a good minute. When she pulled away, all she could do was say, thank you. You're welcome, I said, unable to find anything else to say. I left the hospital and went to the station. The head ranger told me to go home, but I needed to know how things had ended. You don't want to hear this right now, he said. Yes, I do. He sighed and handed me the report. A total of 26 dead bodies were found in the cave, including the ranger who was with me. In stunning irony, the creature's last victim was the ranger who had tracked it to its lair and led it to its death. The creature was mutilated beyond any hope of identification. There was speculation that it may have been some genetic mutation of a bear or some other large predator. I didn't care what it was as long as it was dead and there were no more like it. That doesn't exactly go with the ranger's job of keeping all creatures safe, but I didn't care. That thing needed to die. I still work as a ranger in that same park. The investigation showed that I was acting on self-preservation and the preservation of others. I'm okay with it, but I do carry that knife that I use to kill the thing every single day. I never wash the blood off the blade. I'm hoping the scent to be a deterrent to other predators. That and the 44 Magnum I carry now as a sidearm. I watch things more closely now when I'm on patrol. I wait for another one of those things to appear every day. I wait and I hope I'm the one who gets to kill it. You could say the creature made me what I am today. A hunter. A killer. A monster. Never Camp Alone. You'll Regret It. By Takea. This story takes place last week. Me and my friend decided to go on a camping trip. I decided to bring Chief, my 150 pound Newfoundland dog. Before I continue, I just want to say that Chief is not like most Newfies. He was born and lived in the bush for what I believe was the first year of his life and developed good hunting skills during it. I found him caught in my trap lines nine months ago. I'll skip over a bunch of stuff to cut to the chase. We bonded during his recovery very strongly. He is now a strong, healthy farm and guard dog. Anyway, one day me and my friend, we'll call him Jimmy, decided to go on a week-long camping trip in northern Ontario. So, we packed our bags, took a week off work, jumped into my F-150, and headed north. When we reached the woods, we put our packs on. I loaded Chief with his little buggy, I built it so he could pull his weight during the summer and fall camping trips versus only having a sled in the winter. That carried our tent, sleeping bags, and we started out. We covered five miles by the time we began to set up camp. Once we were set up for the night, I took Chief's harness off so he could wander around, crap, and do his business. When it was time to eat, I gave Chief his food and we ate. Me and Jimmy sat beside each other and were eating our pork. Chief was laying beside the fire, his head on his paws, looking at us, when he suddenly got to his feet and let out the loudest, deepest bark I have ever heard, which was only increased by the echo of the bush. When we turned, we saw some branches shaking and something running away. We decided that it had to be just a raccoon or just some sort of bear cub. Later that night, we were just chatting. Chief had gone off to pee or something of the like, when we heard something coming up to the left of us. I figured it was just Chief when all of a sudden I saw a flash of black fur to the corner of my eye. Right then and there, Chief barreled between us and the campfire. I turned my head in time to see a man who would have been around 6'1", with a piece of firewood, get to his feet, raise it above his head to hit him. But before he could land a blow, Chief jumped up and landed dead square in his chest, pushing him to the ground. When he landed, before the man could grab Chief, he had bitten his forearm. I don't mean like a nip like your puppy does to be mouthy. But an actual bite like whatever he was doing, it was intentional and he wanted to hurt him. 
It's like if a coyote attacked you, you know? By the time the man realized he was even bitten, Chief was already off. This man whirled around onto his feet, on his hands and knees, and began running back to the wood. He tried to take it, to try to smack Chief, but he was being stared down by the wrinkled and snarled muzzle of Chief. He was standing over the wood growling like a freaking full-grown hyena. I ran over to hold on to Chief and Jimmy helped the man to his feet. We searched him and found stuff that made us realize he didn't come for the marshmallows. We sent him on his way and I told him that if he bothered us again, Chief would not miss a second time. The rest of the trip went as planned and now Chief is laying at my feet beside the wood stove in my shed. He's a good boy and I don't think we could have done that without him. Shadow Man in the Woods by Chris B. A couple of years ago, during July, I was spending time with my best friend. We lived in a suburban neighborhood that was built over forest land. Some of the woods were kept in the backyards for private land. My friends and I were going into these woods because we had grown bored. We walked over to the backyard and we started to walk up a hill. When we arrived at the top, we were standing in front of some bushes, about up to our waist. The woods were just behind these bushes. This was around noon, and it was a hot day with no breeze at all. We started to walk past the bushes when they started to rustle violently. This caused us to jump back, nearly sending me tumbling down the hill. My friend was so scared that he began running back down the hill in sheer terror. I looked back at him and taunted him for being a scaredy cat. I told him that it could have even been a squirrel or something of that nature. I mean, rustling bushes don't necessarily mean it's a monster, right? Especially during the day. I wasn't expecting anything else. After I told him, he was still standing there for about two seconds and ran home. I laughed a little inside. I turned around back to the bushes, and that's when I saw it. Now, to be honest, I did only see it for a split second. It was taller than I, and it was definitely pitch black if I had to explain a color. It was staring me right in the face. It looked like a man's shadow. I knew it wasn't mine because I had frozen up with fear and this one had what seemed to be a hat. It then ran away to my left before disappearing right before my eyes. I started feeling a cold sensation and began running down to my friend's house and told him everything. I ask you all, what was that thing I saw? I've never seen it again but I can never forget that moment. If anyone can shed some light, I would be very thankful. The Phantom Hiker by Anonymous My friends and I used to go hiking and camping every spring and summer in an area known as the Bacon Woods. We had a number of odd events happen over the years there. The particular time I want to share happened about June of 88. Dave and I had gone out for a day hike. We decided to hike up to our usual campsite and see what if any fixing up in the fire pit needed to be done. We had brought Doug, Dave's large mixed breed dog with us. We parked at Mill Hollow, Metro Parks, situated north of the Bacon Woods, and we were soon briskly walking down a trail running parallel to the Vermilion River. It was beautiful, and it was a warm early summer day. Around noon, we'd reached a large clearing about 15 feet or so across, midway to our destination, so we decided to take a break for lunch. We built a small fire and soon had water heating for coffee to wash down our sandwiches. We fed Doug, who stretched out for a nap after his meal. After eating, Dave and I were sitting on logs, finishing our coffee and having cigarettes when Doug suddenly rolled over and sat up, staring down the path in the direction we had come from. I looked down the path and through the brush and branches I could see a man headed our way. He appeared to be tall, a bit taller than Dave who is at least six foot two, dressed in wood camo from his hat to his trousers. I didn't think anything of it as we often ran into people out for a hike, just like us for fishing. The figure got to the edge of the clearing and then, right in front of my eyes, just vanished. We both jumped up and went over to the edge of the clearing looking for the fellow who seemed to have just disappeared. Doug, meanwhile, sat there as if bored by it all. We never saw the man or whatever that was again, and I have no idea what I saw that day. 
Haunted Mountain Experience by Anonymous. I often hang out with a friend who was my roommate in college. I've written about our experiences at college before, but this time I want to tell you about a mountain we went to sometimes. His uncle owns an entire mountain in the Caskills, and it's beautiful. We often go hunting there, there's lots of land, but that area is awash with paranormal activity. And this mountain is no different. I've had two separate experiences, but one is scarier than the other. The first one was during deer season. My friend put me in a tree stand that overlooked the open areas of the mountains and we could see all the barns in the house. I was up there for probably the better part of an hour and hadn't seen anything so I was scrolling through Facebook on my phone. And then I heard something strange. I look up and I see some movement in a distant field maybe about 400 yards away and what sounded like drums. I raised my gun and looked through the scope. It was eight or nine people dancing together in a circle. Mostly males, I think. Many of them shirtless. I got on my radio and talked to my friend who was down in the woods about 300 yards in the opposite direction and described to him the situation. I also asked how many people were home and he said there was nobody else there at the time. I watched for another five minutes before the drum beats faded and the people disappeared one by one. My friend said it was likely Native American spirits practicing their ancient rituals. The second incident was when we were just walking up the hill. We came to an opening. It was an old overgrown field, not very large, and there were a couple of old rusty cars laying around. We got to a small knoll, maybe about 75 yards away from us, and there was also an old well there. The kind that's like circular where you had to drop a bucket down into it. It was broken down and very old, but not in too bad of shape overall all things considered. What happened next left us paralyzed and gave me, and maybe him, several sleepless nights. A man suddenly came climbing up out of the well, old style clothes and a beard. When he got up, he stopped and looked all around, and despite us being right there, he didn't seem to notice us at all. He ran into the woods and disappeared. Apparently, historically, some unsavory characters used to dispose of bodies down that well. I don't know if it was a full-bodied apparition of a victim or something more sinister. Backwoods Virginia is no joke by Jackson T. The crisp autumn air tickled my face as I ventured deeper into the vast wilderness of the backwoods in Virginia. I had always found solace in the solitude of nature, but this solo hiking trip was my escape from the chaos of the city. Little did I know that this journey would turn sinister, plunging me into a nightmarish world I could have never imagined. As I trekked along the narrow, winding trail, a sense of unease settled over me. It started as a subtle tingling in the back of my neck a fleeting whisper of a presence lurking just beyond my line of sight. I shrugged it off as my mind playing tricks on me, dismissing it as a byproduct of the eerie atmosphere of the forest. But the feeling, it persisted, growing stronger with each passing step. Seeing eyes were watching my every move, studying my vulnerability. A shiver racing down my spine and I couldn't shake the creeping sensation that I was being stalked. I stopped in my tracks, my heart pounding, and glanced around expecting to glimpse my pursuer. However, the forest remained eerily still, not a single leaf rustling and no sign of movement. I reasoned that it must have been my overactive imagination, fueled by my stories that I have heard a million times on the internet. I had also heard local folklore about these woods, but I figured these were mere figments of my subconscious. Determined to shake off my unfounded fears, I continued my hike, quickening my pace and the distance between myself and whatever oppressive presence was following me. But the relentless feeling of being hunted clung to me like a suffocating shadow. With each passing minute, I intensified. This drove me to the edge of paranoia. I decided to take a break and gather my composure, 
I found a fallen log near a trickling stream and sat down, trying to catch my breath any way I could. The forest silence weighed heavily upon me, broken only by the faint rustling of leaves and the distant hoot of an owl. I scanned the surroundings, my eyes darting from tree to tree expecting to see the lurking figure, but nothing ever revealed itself. Suddenly, I caught a glimpse of movement out of the corner of my eye, a fleeting shadow darting between the trees. My heart skipped a beat as I leapt to my feet, adrenaline surging through my veins. I called out, my voice trembling. Is someone there? Silence greeted my words, mocking my unease. I convinced myself that it was just a woodland creature scurrying away. Nothing more, nothing less. Yet my trepidation, it persisted, urging me to investigate further. With a deep breath, I ventured off the trail, pushing through the underbrush towards where I had seen the shadowy figure. The forest grew denser, its embrace growing tighter as if it was a warning for me to turn back. But for some weird reason, almost like I was possessed, I pressed on, my curiosity fueled by the fear and determination I felt. Minutes turned into hours as I trudged more profoundly into the wilderness. The foliage grew thicker, casting elongated shadows that danced around me. The oppressive silence was broken only by the rhythmic thump of my heartbeat. My senses were on high alert, every rustle of the leaves and distant crack of branches echoing like an alarm in my mind. Then, as if emerging from a twisted nightmare, I stumbled upon a clearing, a macabre tableau frozen in time. The ground was littered with decaying carcasses, their rotting flesh picked clean by scavengers. The stench of death filled the air, suffocating and repulsive. My stomach turned, threatening to unleash its contents. I cast in horror, recoiling as I recognized and realized the gruesome truth. These were not remains of animals. They were human. A wave of nausea crashed over me, and bile rose in my throat. The magnitude of the horror before me was incomprehensible. How could this be? How, who could have done such a thing? A noise behind me shattered the silence, wrenching me from my shock-induced stupor. I spun around, my heart pounding in my ears, only to come face to face with the source of my terror. It stood there, towering over me, a monstrous figure covered in tattered rags, its grotesque face hidden beneath a mask of stitched-together flesh. Fear paralyzed my every muscle as I found myself trapped in its gaze. It had lifeless eyes. Its mouth was opened, emitting an otherworldly hiss that seemed to penetrate my very soul. My mind reeled, unable to comprehend the nightmarish entity before me. With an unholy speed, the creature lunged towards me, its jagged claws reaching out to tear me apart. At that moment, pure instinct took over and I sprinted away, my legs pumping with desperate adrenaline. The forest became a blur of shapes and colors as I raced through the undergrowth, desperate to escape the clutches of this abomination. My heart pounded in my chest, my breath coming in ragged gasps as I sprinted back toward the trail. The creature's blood-curdling screams echoed behind me, growing more distant with every step. I dared not to stop, I dared not to look back, afraid its horrifying visage would haunt my dreams forever. Finally, I burst out onto the trail, gasping for air my body drenched in sweat. I stumbled forward, propelled by sheer willpower, until I reached the safety of my car. With trembling hands, I fumbled for the keys, slammed the door shut, locking myself in with the sanctuary of the vehicle. I peered through the windshield, scanning the tree line, half expecting the creature to emerge from the shadows at any given moment, but it remained hidden within the forest depths, its malice lurking in the darkness. As I drove away, my mind was a whirlwind of terror and disbelief. I knew the horrors I had witnessed would forever haunt me. Virginia's backwoods held ancient and evil secrets that were better left undisturbed. And as long as that creature roamed freely, I could never be sure it wouldn't find me again, lurking in the shadows, waiting to claim its next victim. A Cold Day in Louisiana 
by Anonymous. Here's a story that occurred to me about four years ago. It was an abnormally cold day. Sure, it can get cold in the late parts of the year, but usually in Louisiana, it doesn't get that cold. Maybe around the high 50s, maybe 60s, but on that day, it was in the low 20s. The carbon dioxide was like a cigarette smoke that came from my mouth as I sighed. I had two layers of coats on, very heavy coats, plus a bunch of other stuff to keep me warm. It was a long day at school, and I was ready to get out of there. The school is surrounded by somewhat dense forest. I always look in the tree line as I walk home from school, because I just feel like I'm not alone and I'm being watched. As school ended, I eagerly barked out of the gate and started walking home. My house is a good 30, maybe 40 minutes away. I walked down the same path through the woods as I always did, when suddenly I heard a scream, or more like a screech, that echoed in the forest. It has probably been 20 minutes since I began my walk through the woods, and it's already getting dark. I then begin to smell the stench of something rotten. That is when I almost trip on something. I looked down and almost puked. There, in front of me, were the horrifically mangled remains of a man who had gone missing a few days prior. I froze and moved only my eyes spastically left to right. Nothing. Suddenly, the, the, the same screech echoed in the woods, but this time closer than before. I froze again. Then I heard the spine-chilling crunch of leaves and sticks not too far away from where I was. Then, from out of nowhere, the temperature suddenly spiked. It went from freezing to what felt like summer weather, meaning that it gets to almost 110 degrees out of nowhere. By now, I was scared out of my mind. I started fast walking when something felt like it was watching me. I swerved around, and with the dying light, I saw it. It was fast. So fast that I only caught the sheer size of whatever it was. It was at least eight feet tall. I screamed unintentionally and ran. Then, I tripped on the roots of a tree that were probably three-fourths of the way through the forest, which ended up absolutely murdering my right leg. Then, I saw those eyes. It was pitch black and the temperature was so dang hot. But, I know what I was looking at. It was a set of eyes, at least 15 feet away just staring at me. They were glowing yellow with jet black viper pupils. I slowly reached in my back pocket, not leaving the vision of those eyes. My fingers met my phone and I pulled it out gingerly. I turned the flashlight on and I still have nightmares about it to this day. In the few seconds I had, I screamed the absolute crap out of my lungs at that sight. The beast was dark crimson in color, almost like blood. Its sternum protruded from its chest with a point. It had long, black hair with two curved crimson horns. It had two pairs of blood-red wings. The upper ones were massive while the lower ones were shorter and thinner. A long crimson tail flipped in the air as well. Instead of fingers, it had what I can describe more like clawed talons. But what the most horrifying thing about this creature was was its unholy grin. That darn grin was stretching to its ears and its teeth were huge. It, uh, like, th these teeth, if I had to guess, were at least an, a foot long or so. They were like kitchen knives. Before I could even take a picture, it ran off with such speed that it pulled air away. And I started limping away, not noticing that the bone in my leg was literally protruding through my skin. Then I fell, looked up, and there it was. It grabbed me and hoisted me in the air. It had me face to face. It snorted in my face. It reeked of decay. It was the most disgusting thing I think I've ever smelled in my life. I was 13 at the time, and I was a major wuss, some would say. I cried. I sobbed, and my face went to tears. It is at that point the creature, maybe feeling sympathetic, cocked its head and put a finger to my mouth. It was burning hot and felt like stone. Then, everything went black. When I came to, I was at my front door, confused. I looked around and saw very clearly the same glowing eyes at me from bushes in the garden. 
but as soon as I saw them, they vanished. I then looked down at my leg to see that it was back to normal, but I turned my leg over to see something, or someone carved a huge symbol into my knee. I don't know what it was I saw, but I started writing short stories about it ever since. Someone is in the woods by not the real John Cena. This story was recently unlocked in my memory within the last week or so, and I think I forced myself to forget it because it was so damn creepy. Flashback to around the year 2010. I was 9 or 10 years old, and it was a lovely summer evening in the Midwest. My buddy, who I'll call Chase for this story, invited me and two other friends in the neighborhood for a sleepover. As I said, we were at an age where adult supervision started slipping, and Chase's house was an excellent spot for unsupervised shenanigans. A relatively older couple adopted Chase. I remember his parents being in their late 50s while most of ours were in their 30s or early 40s. His father was paralyzed from the legs down while serving in the Gulf War and required caretakers. His mom was some business executive who wasn't in town too much. In addition, Chase's only sibling was much older and had already moved out for college by this time. So whenever we were hanging out there, there was rarely many eyes on us. We never did anything wrong, mind you, but typical stuff you'd imagine kids at the time would do. Shooting airsoft guns, putting all kinds of crazy seasonings and instant ramen, staying up late playing M-rated games, and all that good stuff. Chase's house was also by far the most prominent in the neighborhood sitting on top of a hill with a gate, a long driveway, and a huge yard that surrounded the perimeter of the house that backed into a wooded area that eventually led into a state forest. This particular night, Chase thinks it would be a good idea to set up a tent in the woods and camp out for the night. While I don't think we were jumping out of our skins to do this, we all did comply on the condition that we stayed at the edge of the woods to use the bathroom and get snacks quickly from the house. We set the tent up, laid our sleeping bags, grabbed as much junk food as possible, and hung out in the tent for the night. We goofed around for a few hours, even after the sun sets until the sugar high dies off and the unhealthy food settles in, and we one by one fall asleep. I was usually the first to crash at sleepovers, and tonight was no different. However, this sleep was brief. I got woken up by someone shaking me out of the pitch black. As my eyes adjust, my friend's concerned face comes into focus. Before I can chew him out for waking me up, he whispers, Hey, hey, do you hear that? I sat up carefully until I heard the noise he was talking about, noticing another one of my friends was also awake. It was a whistle. Somebody out in the woods was whistling. Each whistle was drawn out and breathy, followed by another equally drawn out note. Even writing about this now still gives me goosebumps. From the sounds of it, it wasn't that close, but not that far either. I'm sure my expression turned to horror as my friends woke the last friend up. We all sat in silence and listened for a minute, trying to determine the direction of the whistling. It could have been coming from the house. Maybe one of Chase's dad's caretakers decided to stay the night, but this didn't usually happen. It's not something that ever happened, actually. It didn't take us very long to realize that the whistling was coming from within the woods, and it certainly was not coming from the house. But it was getting closer to us. With that... We were out of there. We took 15 seconds or less to get our shoes on and sprint to the front porch. We left everything in there. Our snacks, pillows, sleeping bags, DSs, we didn't dare to go back. Under the light of this heavily illuminated driveway, it's like a mini parking lot. We all gained a newfound confidence. At this time, we convinced ourselves we weren't scared. So we got our airsoft guns from the garage and started to basically sit behind the trash and started taking shots into the woods trying to intimidate or attack whoever was out there. As we were yelling like a bunch of idiots, we couldn't hear anything. But at this point, we, we cooled down. We listened intently and didn't hear anything more. Knowing that we were satisfied and went to sleep on his living room floor after this, after playing a little bit of Xbox, that experience was creepy and lasting. But what was most terrifying was what happened the following day. We all woke up and started talking about how creepy everything that had happened last night was and under the light of day made the walk down to our tent. 
As we got closer, we noticed something looked off about the tent. It had been completely thrashed. The rain tarp that had primarily been, you know, tied to everything else was yanked off. It looked like one of the corners had caved in like someone broke it. And the poles looked like they were bent in half in several places. Yeah, we had left in a hurry. But I find it hard to believe that four ten-year-olds could do this amount of damage by just running out of the tent. Making our way over to the front of the tent, my face dropped when we saw an extent of all the carnage. Everything inside was trashed. Our snacks had been dumped out and seemingly stomped on. Several of the sleeping bags and pillows were thrown into the woods and cut open. Chase's DS had been snapped in half, and worst of all, one of the sides of the tent had slits all along the side of it, as if some psycho had a stabbing frenzy. All of us shockingly said little. Despite all of the bravados we had boasting about how we were not scared and we were going to beat up whatever was in the woods the previous night, the four of us packed up the tent, gathered the stuff we could, and brought it back to the house. Chase's family probably never would have used that tent again anyways, and I'm sure he just convinced his family to buy them a new one since they were more well off than most of us. After this sleepover, we all naturally separated as friends. It was at the end of summer of fifth grade, Chase went to a private middle school and the rest of us went to a public one, where we were then separated into different cliques. I never thought about this incident again until I ran into one of my other friends there recently when I was back in my hometown visiting family. After catching up, we exchanged numbers, and lately, after seeing a Reddit thread about submitting your own scary stories to a channel called Swamp Dweller, I really had all these memories rushing back to me. I decided that I wanted to share this story, because no matter how many times I think about it, Something still just feels off. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true horror stories that'll freak you out tonight. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to slap that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it, and that helps out the swamp grow. Be sure to subscribe if you're new, turn on notifications as I upload them nearly every single day on all things natural and supernatural. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'm always looking for brand new stories to share. If you're on the go but don't have YouTube Premium but still want to download and listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can download them absolutely free from Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and pretty much everywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. It would mean a lot if you would drop us a five-star rating over on those platforms as it helps us grow over there as well. Down in the comments below, I would love to know what your favorite story was tonight. It helps me pick better stories for the future, and I always love getting your feedback. You can tell me if it sucks, I'm not going to cry, maybe just one tear though. If you made it all the way to the end, be sure to comment the code word single tier. The funniest comment, as always, will be pinned at the top. I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode. Don't forget to come join me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the fun places that you can find me. And I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode. <laughs>